Members of the Senate and guests will please rise as we receive our distinguished president. Senator, will please come to order. Members and guests will remain standing as we're led in devotion by our chaplain, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, Dr. St. John. In Exodus, Moses says to the Lord God, O Lord, please send someone else to do it. From Exodus chapter 4, verse 13. Let us pray. Holy God, we remember how even your servant Moses demonstrated clear reluctance to follow your call for him to carry out your will. His story reminds all of us how challenging it is for us also to be the sorts of leaders you want us to be. After all, it is a difficult, time-consuming, and sometimes frustrating request you make of us to be leaders who boldly do the often hard work you expect us to complete. Therefore, Lord, our plea today is straightforward and quite simple that you grant to each of your servants in the Senate the determination to do what is right and just, to go ahead with what they know to be necessary and not to wait for someone else to do the work for them. May each senator and staff member honor you through their active service on behalf of all South Carolinians. In your loving name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Senator from Oconee, what purpose do you rise? But the form has been questioned. Clerk will count. Twenty-nine members are now present. A quorum is present. Mr. President. Senator from Oconee. Um, you now ask consent for leave for today for the senator from Florence. There's objection. Hearing none, so ordered. Come to order. Come to order. Are there any petitions, memorials, presentments of grand jury, or such like paper? Clerk, what are you? Message from the government, Mr. President, members of the Senate. Transmitting here with the following appointments for confirmation. These appointments are made with the vice consent of the Senate and therefore submitted for your consideration. Reappointment of, the mem of a member to the Department of Transportation, Mr. Tony K. Cox of North Myrtle Beach. Referred to the Transportation Committee. Member of the Mental Health Commission, 5th Congressional District, Dr. Crystal A. Maxwell of Fort Mill. Medical Affairs Committee. State Board of Financial Institutions, Mrs. Miss Jennifer Michaels of Sumter. Banking and Insurance Committee. Reappointment member of the Department of Natural Resources Board, 6th Congressional District, Mr. Dwayne M. Swigert of Hardyville. Fish, Game, and Forestry Committee. Chairman and reappoint, reappointment as chairman of the Department of Natural Resources Board, 4th Congressional District, Mr. Norman F. Pulliam of Spartanburg. Fish, Game, and Forestry Committee. Reappointment member, Donate Life South Carolina at large, Mr. John P. Brogan of Bluffton. Medical Affairs Committee. Appointment to Donate Life South Carolina, Mr. Alan Sipe of Merle's Inlet. Medical Affairs Committee. Reappointment member of the State Athletic Commission, Mr. Edwin M. Estridge of Chapin. Labor, Commerce, and Industry Committee. Reappointment member of State Board of Cosmetology, Mrs. LaQuinta W. Horton of Cassett. Labor, Commerce, and Industry Committee. Reappointment member of the State Board of Occupational Therapy, Mr. Ricardo Holmes of Columbia. 
Medical Affairs Committee. Appointment, 4th Congressional District to the State Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners, Dr. George Scott Bryant of Moore. Agriculture Committee. Initial appointment to the State Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners, 5th Congressional District, Dr. Christine E. White of Rock Hill. Agriculture Committee. Yes, it's clear, Mr. President. We have no further communications. Therefore, we are on the introduction of new bills and resolutions. Clerk will read. Introduction of a bill by Senator Hutto amending the code relating to exemptions from state sales tax so as to include an agribusiness processor as a manufacturing facility for purposes of the exemption on construction materials. Referred to Finance Committee. Bill by Senator Bennett in the men's code adds a section so as to provide certain terms and their definitions and to provide an airport management entity may regulate the use of airport facilities by vehicle companies. Senator from Spartanburg. Oh, okay. Referred to the Transportation Committee. Clerk will read. Introduction of a bill by Senator Bennett. It amends sections of the code relating to the establishment of biennial vehicle registration periods so as to establish annual vehicle registration periods. Adds a section to the code to provide for the annual payment of vehicle registration and license fees. Transportation Committee. Bill by Senators Alexander, Sheely, and Peeler, amending the code relating to the composition and governance of the Department of Disabilities and Special Needs to provide that the department shall be headed by a director who is appointed by the governor upon advice and consent of the Senate, and amending further sections relating to the creation of the Commission on Disabilities and Special Needs to eliminate the commission on the governing body of the department and to reenact re the establishment of the department, its powers and duties. Medical Affairs Committee. Introduction of a bill by Senator Gustafson. It amends a code relating to the Kershaw Health to provide for the composition of the Kershaw Health Board of Directors, the manner of nomination and appointment of the board. Local calendar. Introduction of concurrent resolution by Senator Rice with question Department of Transportation name a portion of Main Street in the town of Easley and Pickens County, Professor John T. Simpson Memorial Drive, direct appropriate signs and markers. Transportation Committee. Labor, Commerce, and Industry Committee reports favorable with amendments on S-533, bill by Senator Sheely. It's a joint resolution by Senator Sheely to prohibit the use of Section 14C of the Fair Labor Standards Act to pay minimum, sub-minimum wages to individuals with disabilities. Placed on the calendar. Fish, Game, and Forestry Committee is reported favorable on H-3056. This is a bill which repeals sections of the code relating to Presswood Lake Wildlife Refuge Boards and repealing further sections relating to further advisory and fish commission boards and repealing an article relating to the fish and wildlife projects in Marlboro County and repealing a chapter relating to the Ennery River Greenway Commission. Placed on the calendar. Fish Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? Uh, who was the author of that last bill? House bill. Still want to know? Yes, sir. Representative Hickson. Thank you. Look where he. Fish, Game, and Forestry Committee reports favorable on H3548, bill amending the code relating to the possession of non game devices so as to delete the prohibition on the possession of a game fish device while possessing or using a non game device. Placed on the calendar. Yes, it's the desk is clear. The any request for local bills? Senator from Greenville, Senator Corbin, what purpose do you rise? Request for local bill 711. On page two? Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. President. Senate Bill 711, amendments on the desk. Clerk will publish the amendment. Mr. President. Senator from Greenville, Senator Corbin. Well, explain the amendment after it's published. Clerk will it, read. Amendment 1A is by Senator Corbin, amends the bill. Strike, strike section one. Senator Corbin. Mr. President. All this Let amendment. me get you some order. Senators, please come to order. Please come to order. Take your conversations outside, please. Mr. President, all, Mr. This, all this amendment does is describe the community. And so I move for adoption of the amendment. Question is, adoption of the amendment, Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Hutto, no. Senator from Greenville, Senator Allen, what purpose do you rise? See if the Senator from Greenville will yield for a question. Sure. He will. 
Senator, I'm looking at this, and I regret I didn't have a chance to talk to you about it, but where is this community you are making reference to? Senator, it's 100% in Greenville County. It's 100% in Senate District 5. And all this bill does is reference a name. It's like a oh, road naming bill, but it's just for a community. Only, in all, your, only references your Senate district? That is correct. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pro. Question is? Question is, adoption of the amendment. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment's adopted. No further amendments. Question is, second reading of the bill. Senator from Greenville, Senator Loftus, what purpose do you rise? I had a question on the, on the boundaries. Is it too late to ask that? No, it's not too late. Senator, the boundaries are, are within the amendment. It's just, it's just the road directions around the community. I'll be happy to share them with you here. Would you carry this over? Um, I prefer not to, Senator, because we're up against the, um, the crossover deadline. As I said, it's 100% in District 5, and all it is is a name. Senator Loft, is he still thinking? Uh, I, I request to carry it over, if unanimous consent to carry it over. Uh, motion is to carry over the amendment. All in favor say aye. Uh, now the bill. All in favor carrying over the bill say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. It's carried over. Any other? Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Hutto, what purpose do you rise? Uh, to give ask a second reading to 691 on page one. It's a Barnwell County school consolidation bill. Question is, second reading of Senate Bill 691. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The bill's given second reading. Any other requests for local bills? Senator from Berkeley, Senator Grooms, what purpose do you rise? Unanimous consent for leave for Senator from Charleston, Senator Campson, until 1.30. Objection. Hearing none, so ordered. Senator from Macon, Senator Young, what purpose do you rise? Unanimous, unanimous consent for leave for the Senator from York, Senator Johnson. Objection. Hearing none, so ordered. Senator from Clarendon, Senator Johnson. Request for leave for the Senator from Sumter, Senator McElveen, to, okay. until 2 o'clock. Objection. Hearing none, so ordered. Sent from Anderson, Sent to Cash, what purpose do you rise? Sent to distribute materials. Is objection? Hear none, so ordered. Sent from Fairfield, Sent to Fanning, what purpose do you rise? Unanimous consent request. State your request, sir. Leave the Senator for Richardson, Senator McLeod. Is objection? Hear none, so ordered. Sent from Kershaw, Sent to Gustafson, what purpose do you rise? Uh, unanimous consent to distribute materials to the body, please, sir. Is objection? Hear none, so ordered. Sent from Spartanburg, sent to Kimbrell, what purpose do you rise? Unanimous consent to distribute literature, Mr. President. Is objection? Hearing none, so order. Sent from Newberry, sent to Cromer, what purpose do you rise? Unanimous consent request. State your request, sir. Uh, leave for the senator from Charles and uh, Senator Campson. Is objection? Hearing none, so order. Two leaves. Senator from Darlington, Senator Malloy, what purpose do you rise? Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to get the Senate's attention for a second. I have a unanimous consent request. If I could get your attention, please come to order. Senator from Darlington. I want to make this unanimous consent request because you can feel the energy in the room. And I think that what happens is, is that we're three days before crossover. And I know that we got a lot of bills to end up passing. And so we got a lot of folks that have asked for leave. We have a lot of folks that are returning so that we can be clear. And so um, one of the things that we had in this body for a period of time was roll calls, and we ended up having um, a roll call vote. And we have, we have sort of abandoned that this year. And um, I, I, I sort of cautioned to, and gave a little warning to the senator from Edgefield I was going to do this. And so I think for these last, um, for today and these last three days, that unless someone requests it, I'm asking unanimous consent that we suspend the requirement for the roll call vote on second reading, because what we're doing is, is that we it's confusing a little bit, but I want to make certain that we have to ask for the unanimous consent each and every time. 
So um, there were some of us that didn't think we needed to do that in the beginning. So unanimous consent that we suspend the rules for the roll call vote on, on, on the second or substantive reading. There's an objection. Objection's heard. Any other requests for local bills? Hey, nine, we're on the call of the uncontested statewide calendar, page three, top of the page, Senate Bill 527, amendments on the desk. So we'll publish the amendment. The amendment is by Senators Garrett and Malloy. It means the bill strikes all out the enacting words. Senator answers. McCormick, Senator Garrett, what purpose do you rise? Explain the amendment. You recognize, sir. The amendment tightens up the language from a legal separation to an order of separate support and maintenance, and further, it provides uh, a, 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 an avenue for persons to seek the 4% by signing an affidavit that they are, in fact, legally separated or under an order of separate support and maintenance. There's an objection to considering the amendment on third reading. There's an objection. Hearing none, so ordered. Now the question is, adoption of the amendment. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment's adopted. Yeah, no, further no, amendments, Mr. no further amendments. Now it's going to require a roll call. Roll call on Senate Bill 527 as amended. Clerk will ring the bell. Reading clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adams. Mr. Adams not voting. Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. Allen, aye. Mr. Bennett, aye. Mr. Campson has leave. Mr. Cash, aye. Mr. Clymer, aye. Mr. Corbin, aye. Mr. Cromer, aye. Mr. Davis, aye. Mr. Fanning, aye. Mr. Gambrell, aye. Mr. Garrett, aye. Mr. Goldfinch, aye. Mr. Grooms, aye. Mrs. Gustafson, Aye, Mr. Harpootlian. Aye, Mr. Hembry. Aye, Mr. Hutto. Aye, Mr. Jackson. Not voting, Mr. Kevin Johnson. Aye. Mr. Michael Johnson has leave. Mr. Kimbrell. Aye, Mr. Kempson. Aye. Mr. Leatherman has leave. Mr. Loftus. Aye. Mr. Malloy. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mrs. Matthews. Not voting. Mr. McElveen has leave. Ms. McLeod has leave. Mr. Peeler. Aye. Aye. Mr. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Rice. Aye. Mr. Saab. Aye. Mr. Scott. Aye. Mrs. Sin has leave. Mr. Setzler. Aye. Mrs. Sheely. Aye. Mr. Stevens. Aye. Mr. Talley. Aye. Mr. Turner. Aye, Mr. Verdon. Aye, Mr. Williams. Aye, Mr. Young. Aye. Five senators voted. Senator Adams votes aye. Five senators voted. Polls were closed. Clerk will tabulate. My vote of 38 to 0, the bill is given third reading. Now we're on Senate Bill 28 now. The amendment's on the desk. Clerk will publish the amendment. Send it from Darlington. Malloy. Clerk will publish the amendment. There's an objection to the Senator's unanimous consent to go into the Second Amendment on the bill. Hearing none, so ordered, Clerk will publish the Second Amendment. The amendment is by Senator Malloy. It's men's bill. Let me get some order. We must come to order, Senate. We will not proceed until you come to order. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. I um, want to um, make certain that I can get the attention of the body because this is something that's critical. This is a bill that we... You know, the argument is, is that, oh, we passed it before. Senator, the desk can't hear you. I'm quite sure the senators can't. Senators, please come to order. Senator Malloy. Thank you. This is a bill that we've had on the calendar for a while. I know the argument is, is that we've done it before, 
And so why not do it again? But there's a lot of things that we do until we learn that there's a better option. And, and obviously, um, this one is, is, is a racket, the best way I can describe it. So I think that the industry that does ignition interlock, um, one, knows that on a first offense, what this bill does, and it glossed over me the first time too, that if you get a first offense and almost everybody in the land says refuse, you refuse. You don't take the breathalyzer or you don't do those tests. Well, what this does, what the bill does, I think is the problem, is that on a first offense chance, on a first offense, normally if you refuse, if you ask for the temporary alcohol license, you can go and get one on those purposes until you have your hearing. What they're doing is making us go and get an ignition interlock. And so this bill would require three months in an ignition interlock device to be installed on the driver's vehicle as a prerequisite to obtaining a temporary license. And I realize what they'll say is, so you know what? Driving is not a right, it's a privilege. So why they give us some rights to end up appealing it and having an administrative hearing. And before you get to your administrative hearing, then you gotta go and pay some unknown quantity, some unknown group to end up getting a, a machine you gotta put on your car and blow into it. Now, what happens now? What happens now is, is that if you have a charge, if a person has a charge, and it happens to a lot of people. It's happened to one of our former presidents. It's happened to people that are very close and near and dear to all of us. And so when you go, how long does it take to get you a hearing? And so the bill allows you to obtain a temporary alcohol restricted license after suspension related to the charge of, of DUI. And so basically, eliminating the provisions relating to the route restricted license. And so, you know, it goes on to say it gives you credit and implied consent suspension for the time of the international, of the ignition interlock devices installed on your vehicle. You know, in the past, what we have done is that we have done it for those that are blowing over a certain limit and second offense drivers. But this reverts it all the way back. In the beginning, we, we started, we gave folks an opportunity but the first time that it happens, what you then have to do is you don't blow the breathalyzer. And all of a sudden, what you got to do is normally, or you got popcorn in your mouth. And, the, and they write it down and says he refused. Or they got something else going on and they write down an insufficient sample. And they say that the person refused. And so then you got to put an ignition interlock on your vehicle until you can prove yourself innocent. So there's a lot of arguments that can say what happens, you know, where the officers may, may, may not show up. And generally, the reason this thing is, is flawed is because if you refuse, generally the, the three month time period that you have to request a hearing, you're not even going to get a hearing. And so I think there's other provisions that, that we, need, we need to end up having. For example, you know, the... Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? To see if a senator from Darlington would yield for a question. Yes, sir. He will. Senator, you just sparked my thinking a little bit here. Um, obviously, I'm not an attorney. I don't know how all this stuff goes. But you, you made me consider one thing. Could it be easy for somebody with money not to have a problem with this? and somebody without money to have lots of problems? Well, I think that it, that it is a problem. I think that what happens is, is that how soon can you get your case done? How, how soon could you get someone and you're forced, to hire, you're forced to hire a lawyer now on the first offense with these kind of things if there is a refusal? But besides that, I think that it's more industry-driven, um, Senator. I think that, what, um, that, that the industry wants this because they get to sell more ignition interlocks. And so we don't have a barometer as to what it costs and what it saves and what it does. Because what happens, we've been in a pandemic. And so you can't end up using the stats to end up proving anything as it relates to this. And so, so we look at what's happening. 
person gets stopped. They get a charge. They're driving too fast. They don't put on their signal. They may be you know, adjusting their radio or whatever. And all of a sudden, they come in. You can be totally innocent. And you say, wait a minute. You were changing your radio or you were texting or whatever? I think you're under the influence. He says, I'm not blowing that breathalyzer. There's nothing wrong with me. You gotta go, you, you can blow one sooner or later because you gotta get this interlock device, okay, on your first time. And so if you gotta go and get it then, so we'll say, well, okay, guess what? It's gonna cost me five or $600. I guess I'll go ahead and end up getting it done. And then so all of a sudden, you know, here's engineer that is working on a job who is busy and checking his calendar and all those kinds of things. And all of a sudden he says, wait a minute, what happened? Well, listen. It wasn't me. It's not my real issue. But what happened was is that I dipped down and I was adjusting my calendar. Well, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. Shouldn't be texting. Shouldn't be doing those things. But for the first offense, and then you say, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna end up blowing that. That's my right. And I'm gonna end up showing them that one, that I did not blow or whatever it was. And so until that point in time, you have to end up going forward. You have to end up having an, what they call is an administrative hearing the administrative hearing will be set. You know, they'll end up doing it in a jurisdiction where they set it up with DMV. You got to go in there and they have some questions that they'll end up having to end up a standard of proof that they'll end up proving. And if they don't, if they, if they if, you know, the officer can do a good job at these now if they check the boxes. But if they don't, then it could be a period of time before you can end up getting your adjudication. And so I'm okay. I'm okay if you got 15 and over, or you get some, you know, a subsequent offense, you know, I get it. On a first offense, you know, then it becomes something other than what, we're, what we really should be doing. Senator, can I, can I ask you one more question? Sure. So the person who has to install this in the car, the, the object here is obviously we don't want people driving drunk in South Carolina. I don't right. think that's it. That issue isn't even at hand here today, I don't believe. Could someone have to put this in their car before they were even found guilty? Oh, 100%. 100%. And so and another, another thing you got me thinking about when you mentioned an engineer working all the time, kind of made me think of myself. If some, someone might, if it's going to cost $500, they might pay $500 and get on down the road, even if they're, even if they're innocent, right? Is that what you're saying? Well, I think that that's one way of getting past it, but they don't get on down the road. They, they go and they put that initial interlock on their, on their vehicle. And whenever they show up for work or whatever they are doing, and they had refused the test, they're going to have a, a initial interlock on their vehicle. And before you crank it up or get going, you got to blow into it. And so, so, so my, my point is, is that for our society in, this, in the Bible Belt that we live in, that we're always talking about rehabilitation and redemption and those kinds of things. What we're doing is that on a very first offense, if you end up blowing, if you don't blow, or if you, there's something faulty with what happens, and come on, go down to the, go down to the, the bottom of the canteen, and put your dollar and 50 in that machine, and you tell me every time you get a soda, it doesn't work. It's a machine. You got a chance to end up saying that something was flawed or something that was going on so that you may not necessarily refuse. Now, if there's a chance that you come in on a second offense and you can't continue to say that machine is gonna end up being flawed all the time, and so what happens is, is that we're talking about habitual and routine and those kinds of things. And so the second offense, we're not getting a second bite of the apple. I come full circle even on that. I just think we should try the cases. I think we should try the cases, put the standards there and try the cases. And so, and I, I, I firmly believe that we should not be um, carving out exceptions for businesses and those kinds of things is that put an interlock on your personal vehicle, but not on your boss's vehicle, you know? And so I think that we, we did a voice vote for that, but if it goes to the House and come back to the Senate, and we get another chance to that. You can't tell me that, that, your, that your employer is gonna end up ruling supreme over your wife or your husband or whatever it has in your family. I think when you balance the two, I think it's a problem. And so at the core, what we're trying to do is to make sure that we keep our um, highways safe. And I, I, I join with you on that. 
But, but let's address the flaws. The flaws is, and maybe that we can't see them all. Maybe we all have some blind spots that we don't know. But I know this. I know that, that good things, bad things happen to good people. And so we have not taken the course that would say that you cannot drink and drive in South Carolina. And so since that we won't go that far, we, don't, we haven't lowered the standard. And so the standard is what it is. And so now we're going to go to the top end and charge and say on the first offense, on the temporary license, my problem is right now is a temporary license. I get the .15 over. Listen, at .15, I mean, I've, I've seen cases where people are .30. And you, know what, you know what they are? Drunk. Okay? <laughs> right? So if you get up to .35, you know, they got to take them to the hospital and go and get them checked. But, at, but whenever you are, are, when you don't take a breathalyzer, you don't take the breathalyzer. And they say, okay, well, guess what? We're going to give you this blue form, and you got to go and pay $100 to appeal this, first of all. So you pay $100 or to appeal it or whatever it is, Senator from Spartanburg. I'm not exactly sure. It's been a long time. So then they go in there set a hearing. They set a hearing. You say, guess what? I didn't blow because I hadn't had anything to drink, and I don't think it was fair. And this is what happened. They said, well, guess what? You have to blow. That's what the law is. When you sign up, you say that you're going to submit to the test. And that's true. But as you know, what happens is, is that most people don't submit to the test. And so let's say that if you are eating on the road and all of a sudden they, got, they don't do their waiting period right and they don't have that 20-minute thing or you got popcorn kernels in your mouth, you got something that's going on or you didn't remove your dentures or whatever, you know, they, they fail to end up doing something that's right in their checklist on the test. In order to come back and say that, guess what? There's some human error here. Here's what happened. I did not refuse. This is what happened. And so, but during the meantime, before you can show that, guess what? You got to be able to do. You got to go and get that interlock device. And not only have you to pay for that uh, hearing to end up setting it, setting it up for the appeal, you also got to go and pay God knows who set up one of those machines and go in there and look at a film and then get the thing installed on your vehicle and you got to blow it. Well, again, guess what? It's like 90 days and then you have to end up paying, I think it's some monitoring fee. I, I, don't, I don't know it well. I've been busy trying to catch up on Santee Cooper and Gallo and some of these other things. And, um, you know, I can't keep up with the calendar. I went to San Antonio this weekend to watch our women play and man, we came within a little bit of a tip of being in that national championship. But the only good thing that happened was is that we lose to the champion by one and the champions, they win by one or two or whatever it was. So we had a great, great run for our, for our program. And so I come back and I come back and start trying to set the priorities as it relates to, to the Senate now. And I say, you know, let me hang on with this. Let me see if I can put some amendments together so we can so make, it, make it palatable. Can, can I ask one more house? question? Yes, sir. My other question is you mentioned about having this installed in a vehicle. What happens if, let's just say you have a husband and wife and they've got two kids and they both work. Husband, let's say the husband works at a, I don't know, at a manufacturing plant and the wife's a real estate agent. Her car breaks down, goes to the shop. She's got an appointment, got to pick some people up. So... Her husband, he goes to work early and just says, take my car, take my truck. Now, but that, that's only, the interlock's in there. But now it's only for him, right? So the wife wouldn't have to blow into it in front of her clients to get the vehicle to move. Oh, she got to blow. She's got to blow it. And, um, so it's not dependent just on the person? It's no, it dependent on, on the vehicle, vehicle. On the vehicle. And if she then blows, what she's got to do, if she blows more than a .02, if she just had wine with her friends, she, she can't well, Let's assume she doesn't drink. Let's assume she wouldn't even touch a what drop of alcohol. What if she has some Listerine, uh, rinse it out or Just assume times. everything's fine. Okay. If it's not for the, for the perpetrator, then the spouse, when she has to do that in front of those clients, they may not be clients very long, right? Well, I think that's a problem. I think that's one of the things. I'd like to see it just to the per I mean, look, I want to stop somebody from, from being drunk and driving, but I want to be careful about, 
I didn't realize that, Senator. So let me think about that a little bit. I'll come back to you. Right, and I think that what happens is, is that too is is that the habitual offender gets a chance to. Now I'm all I'm all for getting folks restored. And I think that when we get them restored, I think what happens is that we can get them restored to end up having the opportunity to be able to end up driving again. So if you're under the age of 21, what this bill allows is it allows the option to get an ignition interlock instead of, get, of serving your full suspension. So you gotta have three major offenses before that you habitual offender. So one part of the bill gives you relief and says if you got three infractions and you're under 21, you can get this ignition interlock and then you're able to end up driving. But on the other hand, if you think that you've been charged with driving under the influence and you refuse to blow one time, one time in your life, then you have to get this ignition interlock. And I think that that is a, that is a problem. And so what my amendment does is just very simple, is, is that it just takes it out for the first offenders that refuse to end up blowing up. And, and so it gives us a chance to, to end up um, um, making the bill palatable. I mean, I have some other issues with it, and I think that what happens is I've never articulated some of these before, but one is that, you know, the, um, um, we need to set the guidelines as to how much this thing costs. We're gonna end up punishing our folks with it. You know, for the um, installation, the maintenance, the download and the removal. And so what happens if you go through that process and you say, guess what? State says we're wrong. You, you were right. This was your first offense and they did not do it right. And so, and so what we um, uh, may should consider doing later on is, is that have a plan that, that we come back and approve the changes in, in any fees. And the other thing is this, is that how long how much does it take for you to end up blowing into this thing? So the way that it is, it says is that if you're 0.02 on the meter, then that you can't drive the vehicle. So maybe it won't cover it. You won't rise to that level if you just, you know, had a rinse with Listerine, or maybe if you had, to, had some NyQuil that you took the night before, even though it's alcohol related. I think it's designed for that may should be a little bit higher, but we'll end up seeing. And there's no way to end up. Senator Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? Senator from Darlington, would you have for another question? Yes, sir. Here we go. Again, I'm just, this, I've had a lot of the things on my radar, and, and this is not one of them. But you got me thinking about another example. Again, I've, I've got really no sympathy for somebody that's drunk and driving. I, I don't. But what happens if they're at home and they've got a, Let's say a child with a driver's license um, have a heart attack, live out in the country, and they barely get the, say it's the father, and the daughter or son gets him in the vehicle and goes to drive to the hospital. That child cannot start that car, correct, without knowing what to do with the – so it would still apply to the child that was trying to get somebody to the hospital, correct? It applies to the vehicle. So what it's going to require is, is that regardless of the circumstances, you know, if the person is able to drive, they have to come home and explain you know, listen, let me do a demonstration for you. This is the first time I've ever had this issue to end up happening. I'm not, I'm not guilty, I'm not responsible, I'm gonna fight it. And, but you know, if you're ever gonna drive this car, what you gotta do is you gotta be able to blow into this, blow into this machine before you can get it started. So they would need to be trained on that? By the, by, probably by, by the parent. They okay. can't be trained by, they, would, they wouldn't be trained by anybody else, only the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator would be the ones that was trained. And, and here's the thing. I'm not going to belabor it much, much longer. And the senator from um, uh, McCormick, I know you do some of these cases, but, if, but for a first offense, no matter what you end up blowing, you, well, we know, no, no matter if you refuse, you know, most of the times, here's what I would say to that you and, um, and many other people in the community would do. I won't say you, other people in the community that are similarly situated. If you ever get stopped, why would you? Why would you blow the breathalyzer? They don't do it. 
That person's then got to come in and say, okay, well, listen, I got charged, but I was changing my radio and I drove left for center. And we got to come back in. And, and so I'm going to do my appeal now and pay my fee and go get my interlock device put on my vehicle. And, and you say, okay, well, look, I'll go and I'll go through the hearing with you. And they say, well, how, how long is the hearing going to be? Well, I don't know. Depends on how far they're backed up and how we're going to end up getting it done. If it's past 90 days, you're not going to have your hearing in before then. And so what this thing does is it requires three months. It requires three months for you to pay the industry. So let me, let me give you another situation. If it's your second offense, then shame on you. I've come full circle on that one. I didn't, I didn't like it when they had a second offense because it's industry driven. This is not the policy that we have to do. I don't know that it's true. I heard that we may have to leave the state if we can't get more ignition interlocks. Every time we get something like this, it drives the business. And so where I come from, we call that a racket. Not what you hit a tennis ball with, but what you hit the state of the South Carolina upside their head with, the racket. But you know what? You can guide, you can guide it on the back and says, guess what? We're trying to stop DUI drivers. And we all can applaud that and say, you know what? What's the numbers? How you do it? It does not. We're talking about first offenders that happens to any and all of you and me. They would go up to one of those receptions that they have, and drive all the way home, or drive wherever. And it's happened before. The people all around these areas should not have to have it. And so I got some other ones that I am curious to end up doing. I think um, um, Mr. Fiffing in his office has worked on some. Um, you know, I, I think that depends on what happens with, 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 with this one. Um, I think that the, um, the period should end up changing. A fund should be set up. Um, there's a lot of work that actually needs to be done, but folks, um, please let's let this bill go. Let's pass this amendment. It's the only thing that's good for this bill that it cannot be on a first offense. Let it be on second offenses. They should be used to it by then if they've gone through the process before. Go through it again. And so if a person refuses, they should not end up having to end up getting the ignition interlock. And so the last thing I will end up putting is, is that, you know, we're not fooling anybody on this. We don't put mandatory minimums on people. We always deal with first offenses in a way that we end up saying, okay, we got pretrial programs for them. We got other programs for folks if they have a first offense. And we got one that where we allow people, entice them, in fact. It says, we're not going to consider you drinking or drunk until you get to the rebuttal presumption of 0 0.08. How many times have you ever had someone that says, I blew a 0 0.01, a 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.05? They're still charged. Well, they still got to do those cases, and under that circumstance, you know, it's not a problem because they would have blown the breathalyzer. But let's say somebody says, it didn't apply to me because my first time ever, and I realize that it'll give me a suspension, but I want to be able to show them, one, that I did blow, but they said I refused. It's going to take a while before you prove it. So what happens in a situation to where the person does go in, they refuse it. They ask for a hearing. They grant them a hearing. 
is four or five months later, or two or three months later. And then the administrative hearing officer says, you're correct. You, um, um, I'm going to rule in favor of the driver. The guy says, can I get my money back from, for where they messed up? No. No. No way to do that. So we passed my amendment. Here's, what I'm, here's, here's my position. I, I think that one, passing this amendment is bring some clarity to this bill for the first offenders. I think it moves it to um, those that we are trying to end up getting, those that are um, on the highways and, and, and without due regard for others, those that blow to a certain degree, or those that have been convicted. Now, you all know for years and years and years, we didn't have this. And now we are trying to end up doing it. And you know why? There's an industry that is making money. I think it's totally industry driven. And I need to end up making certain that we can pass policy that is good. When they say it's not about the money, it's about the money. And so I join all of you that said we don't like the worst picture you ever want to see is someone that's hit by a drunk driver or someone that has, has an issue as it relates to that. It's not what this is about. It's about putting an ignition interlock on someone that refuses on a first offense and before they can end up getting their hearing, they have to end up having an interlock. And that's all my amendment does. It just takes that provision out. So thank you. Move adoption. Question is the adoption amendment. Senator from Orangeburg, what purpose do you rise? Senator from Orangeburg is recognized on the amendment. Members, I'm going to ask you to vote no on this amendment. This is the same bill we passed last year in this Senate by a vote of 40 to 1. This is the majority of states in this country have ignition interlocks since 2006. Initial interlock has saved 3.5 million attempts by somebody to drive drunk. In other words, since ignition interlock has been on cars across this country, we know that 3.5 million times somebody has tried to drive drunk and blown in that machine and been not able to do that because it didn't start up. That's the whole point of this. We are 23rd in population. We are 10th in highway fatalities related to alcohol. We had nearly 300 people killed in this state last year due to fatalities killed by alcohol. What this amendment does is, is just undermines the bill. The, the bill. Right now, it's already the law that you've got to put the ignition interlock on for second offense. This is an attempt to get down to the first offenders and we, I'm, I'm telling you, the bill we passed without this amendment last year passed 40 to one. I'm asking you to vote this amendment down and let's pass the bill as is. Senator from Darlington, what purpose do you rise? Senator from Darlington is recognized. Here we go again. We did it before. You know, we also passed VC Summer in this body, by who knows how many it was, it was a mistake. We also passed a bill not too long ago that was going to deal with renters. Guess what? We come back. Nobody even seen the provision except for a few people. We had to come back and figure out what it was. And so you can get the numbers and say how many people that blew into the machine and could not drive, well, how many people had it on their machine? How many people had it on their vehicle? That doesn't tell us the statistic as to what it prevented. It could be the same knuckleheads going in over and over and over again. How many people? What we're talking about is a first offense, very first offense. And this is driven by the industry. The numbers. I can say, you know, I can tell you how you can end up preventing it. Don't drive at all. I can tell you how you can prevent it. Take DUI down to 0 0.05. I can tell you how you can prevent it. Get somebody to drive you. Go to McDonald's instead of end up going to a bar. I don't know. But I think that it's fundamentally wrong to end up having a first offense as it relates to a person on interlock. 
And so at issue is, is that whenever you are having the interlock on a person that actually refuses on a very first offense, I get it. Listen, I can't speak to everybody else, but you, you, I challenge everyone in here that has read these bills or talked to anybody that does these kind of cases and say, do you think this is good or bad? And the first offense is the problem offense. I mean, it's not, it's not just the problem offense. It is, it is when someone refuses, we're going to require them to, to have an interlock. Change it. If you get charged and drive, having to end up driving it for continuously. They can't do it. They can't afford it. They can afford five and six hundred dollars. And that's what we're that's what we're trying to end up doing. And so I encourage you to adopt this amendment. And, and the issue that we have is that how many people that that, were, that voted on it before five or six of y'all weren't even here. And the rest of us, I don't even know whether or not that they had engaged in this or not. I don't like first offense. Um, I think that it, that it is a problem. Question is the adoption of the amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed? Roll calls requested. Five members second the call. Five members do. Clerk will ring the bell and call the roll. Question is the adoption of the amendment. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Adams? No. Mr. Alexander? Not voting Mr. Allen? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Mr. Bennett votes aye. Mr. Campson? No. Mr. Cash? Not voting Mr. Clymer? Not voting Mr. Corbin? Mr. Corbin not voting Mr. Cromer? No. Mr. Davis, not voting Mr. Fanning? Aye. Aye. Mr. Gambrel? Aye. Aye. Mr. Garrett, not voting Mr. Goldfinch? No. Mr. Grooms? No. Mrs. Gustafson? Aye. Aye. Mr. Harputlian? Aye. Mr. Hembry? Aye. Aye. Mr. Hutto? No. Mr. Jackson? No. no. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Kevin Johnson? No. no. Mr. Michael Johnson has leave. Mr. Kimbrell? Mr. Kimbrell not voting. Mr. Kempson? Mr. Kempson not voting. Mr. Leatherman has leave. Mr. Loftus? Not voting. Mr. Malloy? Aye. Mr. Martin? Not voting. Mr. Massey? No. Mrs. Matthews. Not voting. Mr. McElveen has leave. Ms. McLeod. No. Mr. Peeler. Not voting. Mr. Rankin. Mr. Rankin not voting. Mr. Rice. No. Mr. Saab. No. Mr. Scott. No. Mrs. Sin has leave. Mr. Setzler. No. Mrs. Sheely, no. Mr. Stevens, no. Mr. Talley, no. Mr. Turner, no. Mr. Verdon, no. Mr. Williams, no. Mr. Young, Mr. Young votes no. All members voted. Senator Cash votes no. Senator Kempson votes no. Senator Harputlian votes no. Senator Kimbrell votes no. Senator Rankin votes no. Senator Alexander votes no. Senator Bennett votes no. Senator Davis votes no. Senator Gambrell votes no. Senator Clymer votes no. Senator Martin Votes no. Senator Turner. Votes no. Senator Peeler. No. Votes no. Senator Corbin. Votes no. Senator Garrett. Votes no. Have all members voted? 
Senator Bright Matthews votes no. If all members voted, polls are closed, clerk will tabulate. By a vote of five to 36, the amendment fails. Senator from Darlington. Inquiry. Yes, sir. Please state your inquiry. How, how many amendments are left on the desk? Two minutes. Two more amendments. Stand easy. Let me take a look at it. Senator from Darlington, what purpose do you rise? Move to with, withdraw amendment number one. There's no objection. In none so ordered. Clerk will publish the next amendment. Next amendment is amendment number four by Senator Malloy, amends the bill on page 27, strikes Senator lines from one through 40. Senator from Darlington, on the amendment. Mr. President, members of the Senate, so here's one of the other several that I end up having. Um, obviously, I think that um, uh, I guess the ignition interlock industry can end up staying now because you did it before. You could probably do it again. And the question becomes is that for a first offense, you know, you're going to get the calls as to, as to what happens on the first offense cases. And so I want to thank you all for, for taking a look at it. I, I just think that it's, that it's um, one of those things that we um, have to end up making a consideration to see what happens after the fact. Maybe it's a good idea whenever you leave home, by, but not necessarily a good idea by the time you get there. And so what this amendment does is that the $100 fee that must be assessed to obtain a temporary alcohol license, the such fee will be held in trust on that first offense by the Department of Motor Vehicles until the final disposition of the contested case. And should a temporary suspension provided in the section be upheld during the contested case hearing, then at the end of the day, what's happening is, is that the, the DMV hold the fees in trust, permit the reimbursement of the fees if the license suspension is overturned. And so that's all this amendment does. And so guess what? If you didn't do it, and you're successful, then you get your money back. And so I think that what that it's appropriate to end up doing so because what's going to happen is is that again, that's the money that goes to DMV. Okay, but we're not addressing the, the the money that goes to Ignition Interlock because they're going to take the money and run. They're going to take the money and run, five or six hundred dollars, whatever it takes, for the six months time period. Six month time period. So this just sets up, up the fund. Move adoption. Question is, adoption of the amendment. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. A vote of zero to zero. <laughs> vote more generally. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Senator from Darlington. I want to finish this bill, but I move to carry it over, the bill. Object to the bill. Jackson's heard on the bill. The bill is now contested. I turn page five, S354. Clerk will read. Any 
There's a committee amendment on the desk. Clerk will publish the amendment. Transportation committee proposes the following amendment. Members of bill, it strikes all after the enacting words and inserts section 562105 amended by adding. Subsection H of municipality may, by ordinance, allow the operation of a permitted golf cart within its jurisdiction on primary highways upon which the posted speed limit is 30 miles per hour or less. Secondary highways upon which the posted speed limit is 35 miles per hour or less. Streets or roads. Section 2 of this act takes effect upon approval by the governor. The question is, adoption of the committee amendment sent from Lexington, Senator Sessler, what purpose do you write? Explanation has been requested. Anyone from Transportation Committee, Senator from Dorchester, Senator Bennett, what purpose do you rise? Uh, to explain the, uh, the bill. Um, Senator, this is, this is the bill we talked about last week, I think, that basically allows for a municipality that has a primary road going through their jurisdiction that is 35 miles an hour or less, allows the municipality to issue a permit that a, that a state permitted golf cart can utilize um, that road. These are typically small towns. Um, doesn't obligate them to, doesn't make it automatic, allows the municipality to, uh, to pull that over. Senator from Lexington. Senator, Senator you. Sure. Senator, I, say, I heard you say it's normally small municipalities, but in fact, if they have a road which meets these requirements, can Greenville, Columbia, Charleston, Myrtle Beach, Buford allow golf carts on these highways? Well, first of all, I was, I was mistaken. It was 30 miles an hour, not 35. So that's the first mistake I made. Uh, but theoretically, yes, they could if they met those. Those cities, my guess is, are not going to do that. The municipality would have to, uh, have to, uh, to, to, to make that ordinance, to pass that ordinance. Senator from Charleston, Senator Kempson, Sen what purpose do you have? Senator, you have a question? Sure. He does. So, can you explain again why this does not apply to Charleston? Senator, it would apply to Charleston if there's a primary road that is 30 miles an hour or less. Mm -hmm. The city of Charleston uh, City Council could pass an ordinance that allows for that, but they could also not. Um, they, they could just not not act on that at all. Those golf carts would not be allowed on those roads. The, the, the municipal government would have to give that authorization. And when you say primary road, what's, what's the definition of that? Um, that is a road that DOT has deemed primary. Is Rutledge Avenue a primary road, do you know? I couldn't tell you. Um, do do did you know i'm concerned about the number of golf carts on primary roads did you know that well there there are no golf carts on primary roads well if rutledge avenue is a primary road it is they are and my guess is it's not a primary road it's a secondary road at that point okay and the concern i have is people don't seem to be able to distinguish between a uh, regular golf cart and a low speed motor vehicle. Those have, those have two different rules that apply to those, Senator. Okay. And did you know the low speed motor vehicles go faster than the non low speed motor vehicles? That's true. And they, those have to be registered and plated just like any other vehicle. And does this bill do anything to, to alter that? Does not touch on that at all, Senator. All right. Thank you, Senator. Move for adoption. Question is, adoption of the committee amendment. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Amendments adopted. There are further amendments. Clerk will publish the next amendment. Amendment number 1A by Senator Hutto amends a bill. It strikes all Senator after the United States. Senator Senator Hutto, what well, purpose do you rise? You recognize her. So I, I join with the senator from Charleston and others who say that maybe this isn't the best idea. But if y'all think that it's a good idea, we, I wanted to clean a few things up. What we've done with this section, if you'll remember, if you've been here long enough to have studied how the progression of golf cart uses on highway has gone, we first were going to allow it in a very isolated situation. Then we 
a gated community. And then we moved from a gated community to one that was like on a barrier island. And then we moved from there to some other things. But, and so we just kept adding on and adding on. And so if you read the section now, it reads like a hodgepodge. So I had staff to go through, and that's what this amendment does, is reorganize the entire section so that it's clear that these things do apply. You've got to be 16. You've got to have a driver's license. The golf cart has to be permitted. The golf cart has to have insurance. It can only operate in daylight hours. And I've added in here that it cannot operate on a four-lane highway. Those, you know, there are small towns that have four-lane highways going through it that have a lot of truck traffic coming through. And is in spite of the fact that we all do owe a, a duty to look out for whatever's on the highway, people just aren't looking for golf carts on main roads. So. I'm not really in favor of this, but if some small towns and they're really small want to adopt this ordinance, and, and that's what the will of the majority is, I just wanted to make sure that at least we said that the other things are going to apply. You got to be 16. You got to have a driver's license. It's got to be a permitted golf cart. You have to have insurance on it. You can only operate it in the daylight hours, and you can't operate it on a four-lane highway. And I think with those restrictions, maybe, maybe that covers those things that everybody's concerned about. I still don't think it's a good idea, but if, uh, you know, I, I wanted to, if, if y'all think that having golf carts on the highways is a good idea, at least we could narrow it down by those six things that I just said. Senator from Lexington, Senator Setzler. Senator you. Yes. He does. Senator, you know I share your concern that I don't like this idea either, but what are the insurance requirements? Same as a car. Same as a car. I, I've added there's got to be minimum limits, so if we change the minimum limits on a car, the minimum limits on a golf cart will apply. Senator from Newberry, Senator Cromer, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, first of all, I'd like to offer unanimous consent request that I be added as a co-sponsor to this amendment. Is there objection? Hearing none so order. Senator, I'd also like to see if Senator yield for a question. He will. Senator, did you know I agree with you wholeheartedly? You'd be surprised at the number of people I see at the beach. The parents just turn the golf cart over to the kids. Kids will be 13 years old. And they'll have three other kids, and they'll be hanging off the back, and they're doing 19 miles an hour, and the car is coming up behind them pretty fast. If one of those kids fall off that back seat, they don't have seat belts. I'd almost want to require seat belts, to be honest with you, to keep those kids from sliding off that seat into the path of an oncoming automobile. Well, I thought about that. I mean, I see the same thing, and y'all know my wife's a pediatrician, and, and she has had the unfortunate circumstance to have children in her practice die from riding on golf carts. They, they are not safe for children to be operating, operating, particularly on a highway with other traffic. I mean, it's one thing maybe if you're in, in your grandfather's or grandparent's yard and you, they're watching you and you're just gonna drive around. I, I wouldn't let my child or grandchildren do that, but, but putting them out on a highway where, if you're not 16, which means you hadn't gone through any kind of driver's training yet, you don't know what all the stop signs mean, yield signs mean. I mean, maybe you do, maybe you do, but you haven't been through any training on hand signals or turn signals or, you know, proper braking distance, how to yield a right of way. Uh, I just think it's a bad idea, number one, to have children on golf carts. Number two, I don't think it's a great idea to have golf carts mixed with regular traffic and trucks out on a highway. I, 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 so don't get me wrong, I, I really don't support this whole notion. But rather than just keep my name on it, I, I um, had told uh, the senator from Pickens that I would take my name off so we could consider it. I'm going to vote against it, but at least I think we need to adopt an amendment that sets those minimum ground rules for what the operation ought to be inside a city that chooses to adopt a municipal ordinance. Because, I mean, to a certain extent, this does get to home rule, right? If a small town potentially wanted to have golf carts, that'd be one thing. But the, the problem with that concept is it's not just city roads within that city town. When we kept it within a gated community, it was just the gated community. When we say now a small town, we got small towns with major truck traffic and, and people going to the you know thoroughfare, people going down to the coast, going up to the mountains. They drive through small towns, and yes, they're going, in theory, in theory, they're going 30 miles an hour. Now, you know that a lot of times when the speed limit's 30, the people on the road are maybe going 40, now a golf cart with two kids pulls out in front of you. 
every time. It's a tragedy. Let me tell you, golf carts do not survive accidents with regular cars, and they get absolutely obliterated by trucks. So it's just not a good idea, in my mind, to have golf carts on the highway. But if we're going to, what this amendment says is you've got a 16 with a license, permitted uh, golf cart, which means that it's got to meet some requirements to get the permit, um, insurance, daylight hours only, four-lane highways that prohibited. And, Senator, did you know I, I agree with you 100 percent. I'd agree with you even more if we put the seatbelt regulation in there. Uh, move adoption. Mr. President. Senator from Anderson, Senator Cash, what purpose do you rise? See if the senator would yield. Yes. He will. Senator, does your amendment change the, the current law in terms of uh, insurance? Is your amendment requiring insurance for all golf carts or just the ones that are going on the public highway or just, just or the what? ones that just the ones that are going to get a permit to drive on the highway okay so if someone's got a golf cart at the lake and all they do is go down to the dock you know with the cooler and back this that wouldn't apply to them is that the way it's drafted there's the difference between a golf cart and a permitted golf cart okay. nobody's required to have a permitted golf cart but only permitted golf carts can go on the highway. Okay, okay. I, I'm beginning to follow you. Okay. Did you know, Senator, that I, I probably end up voting for this bill just under the concept of home rule, but did you know I, I have some concerns? Interestingly enough, one of my children actually works for a golf cart retailer, and, and so did you know that some golf carts could go 19, but uh, a lot of these golf carts are modified. Some of them go up to 28 miles an hour, and they don't have to have seat belts. They don't have to have a horn. They don't have to have turn signals. Uh, it, it, it is a uh, very different things that you see on the road. But did you know I would agree with you when you come up behind someone who's going 19 and you're going 35? That is, a, that is an enormous discrepancy in speed, and, and I guess my, my only concern about just letting this fall to home rule is that there's such a drive in our state now to create uh, a downtown area that draws people in to eat supper and all of that, that I do have some concerns that some municipalities that have very busy downtown streets are going to be reaching for that new business and, and perhaps creating some dangerous scenarios. So uh, it's not without some reservations. I'll probably just vote for it on the basis of home rule. But uh, I, I would tend to agree that, that we've got a hodgepodge here, and I appreciate your work in trying to, to uh, bring some order to it. I just respond in one thing. One other thing you didn't add, they don't have the same bumper height as a, a vehicle. So if you happen to hit a golf cart, it, it, what we require of cars to, to absorb some of that shock is just not there at all with a, with a golf cart. So, but, but, but be that as it may, I, I'm going to uh, offer this amendment just to straighten this section out, I hope, and then we can decide as a policy matter whether we want to adopt the bill or not. Senator from Charleston, Senator Capson, what purpose do you rise? Yes, sir. Senator, as you know, there are a lot of hard fought provisions in this golf cart statute um, over the years as you and you're trying to organize them I just want to make sure that um, have you are you certain that you've included all the provisions that have been added to this section over the years and we're not eliminating any current law that is uh, my understanding. I mean, for instance, the Barrier Island exception is still in here, the gated community exception is still in here. If you look at the parts that I, I struck out, by and large, you'll see them reappear somewhere else. They were just in all different sections, and I really just tried to reorganize it. I, don't, I do not believe I took anything out. I do believe I added a definition to daylight hours and no four-lane highways, and the requirement that the insurance be the same as the automobile insurance, so that you can't just go out and buy a five thousand dollar policy and claim you're insured. Okay. Under your under your amendment, would a golf cart be able to cross a four lane highway? Um, yeah, I, I think it's always been that a um, that a golf cart can cross a highway, um, but uh, 
That's not my intention to keep them from crossing over. Um, I presumably, at a four, if it's a four-lane highway and it's crossover, there's going to be a street light there. But uh, I mean, for instance, Center Street and Folly Beach. I mean, you know, it's theoretically. Four yeah, you lanes. have Center Street at Folly. You have on the Isle of Palms. You have a four lane right there when you get on the island at, well, at the says, shopping center. It, it says that a golf cart's prohibited from operating on a four lane highway. I don't think that means over a four lane highway. But I mean, if you want to clear that up by saying that they can crawl, I, that's not my intention. Okay, thank you. Senator from Dorchester, Senator Bennett, what purpose do you rise? Uh, would Senator yield for a couple of questions? Yes. Question. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. As I was looking through this, it, um, I, I think there were only a couple of items that that you really changed in here is, is really just organizing it. Um, but I do have a couple of questions. Personally, I don't have a problem with the four-lane highway. I think that makes, makes perfect sense. And I don't think that infringes upon the intentions of, of the bill or the author. I don't want to speak to the author, but, but I don't think it uh, infringes upon that. I think everybody is concerned about safety. Senator, did you know there, were, there, were, there are 71, 000, over 71,000 Golf carts registered in the state of South Carolina? Were you aware of that? I know there's a lot of them. I, I do see them around. Senator, do you know how many how many citations were issued last year? Not many. 163 out of 71,000. Um, and obviously, the most important thing. Did you are you aware of the uh, fatal collision uh, numbers for golf carts over the past few years? Well, let me tell you this: if there's a collision with a golf cart. The odds that it's fatal goes is a lot higher than if this is a regular collision. Sure. Would you be surprised, Senator, that in 2016 there were three, uh, 2017 one, 2018 there were none, 2019 there were two, and 2020 there were none. And certainly those uh, six individuals um, will never get back, and, and that's never okay. Uh, but I, but I did, did want to point that out. The, the question, I do have a question about the uh, daylight hours. I mean, would we agree or was it your intention to just limit the travel as much as possible or the use of those vehicles at night or dusk as part of that problem? And if that's the case, Senator, and I don't, I don't know that this is really easy, maybe uh, one day when um, the federal government decides to follow the lead of South Carolina and actually does something about daylight savings time. Uh, but is there any concern about having it limited to five o'clock in the evening when it gets dark at nine o'clock sometimes uh, during the summertime? Well, I thought about how you'd figure that out. And because sometimes it does get dark right after five and dusk is really the worst time to see a golf cart without lights on. So, I, um, I mean, look, the whole, the whole idea of us letting golf carts on highways, I think, is we're making a stretch already. So they just need to make to plan around being back home by 5 o'clock if, if you're going to adopt this amendment. I mean, the problem with saying 6 is that sometimes it's going to be 6. The problem with saying just using the term daylight, that doesn't really have a definition. Officers wouldn't know how – people would – say, well, I thought it was daylight, it's not daylight. We need to pick some time. I picked the latest possible time, which I thought it could be dusk, which would and be. I, and, I, and I think that five o'clock number is probably the perfect number during regular daylight hours. Right. Daylight savings times, however, that's four hours before it gets dark. Uh, and certainly during the summertime is when a lot of these activities happen is my, is my only concern. I don't, I don't necessarily know that I have an answer for it, but it seems to me a little more, bit too restrictive uh, of the five o'clock at some periods of time during the year. I'm open to suggestion, but I, I didn't know how to fix that. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? See if the Senator from Orangeburg would yield for a couple of questions, please. Yes. Will. The, the first question is, I know I, I used to own a 2-5, which had lights and official tag and insurance, seat belts, turn signals. Would this legislation impact that? Is, is that a golf cart? Well, it's a 2.5. It's, it's a low-speed vehicle. This doesn't apply. And this it already has to be tagged through this DMV. doesn't apply. Doesn't even apply to that. Okay. The, the next question I had is based off what the senator from Dorchester just said, and um, 
I know the senator from Charleston is standing. He's probably already thinking this, but when we pass hunting legislation, there's a lot of times that you cannot shoot before 30 minutes before official sunrise or, you know, certain things 30 minutes before official sunset. I'm just wondering if you could do something like put one hour after official sunrise or, you know, and then maybe one hour prior to official sunset, that would get you later in the summertime, whether whether or not the president's bill passes and eliminates um, daylight savings time. But I just wonder if we could consider something like that in your amendment, because I, I don't think I'm opposed to anything you're doing. It's just that I'd hate to have somebody, because we're going to get the phone calls this summer when they got a ticket at 6 o'clock and it's still three hours before dark and they got pulled over and want to know why we voted for it. So. Well, here, here's, the, here's the, the, the only answer I would tell you is this. If you have a number, you know what the number is. As soon as you say it's an hour before some other number, and that number you've got to go look it up on your phone or look it up in the paper, then it, you know, I, yes, we could do that. And if that's what you want to do, I, but I was trying to just come up with a definite time that you could drive a golf cart on a highway, and uh, I tried to pick as close as I could to avoid dusk and, and uh Senator from Marsburg retaining the floor. Senator from Old Reese, Senator Rankin is recognized to introduce the doctor of the day. Thank Senator Mr. Rankin. President, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, look up, if you will, for the doctor of the day, and I want you to have with you the nurse who we know. I want everybody to stand up there. We, we need a sight from above, and it's not just our great nurse, but uh, this is Dr. Coakley, Brandon Coakley. Wave, Dr. Coakley. He is Myrtle Beaches and uh, Horry County, I believe, is the first uh, Mo surgeon that we have. And Mo is Dr. Francis or Franklin, some Mo, uh, a fancy microscopic surgery. If you've got any cancer that is to the naked eye visible, this guy is one to uh, get it out, and he does the Mo's surgery. So uh, you've got, is this a Myrtle Beach assistant with you here? You're not supposed to talk, but if she's from Myrtle Beach, we'll raise your hand. Great. Uh, we welcome both of y'all here as the doctors of the day. And so uh, if anyone asks doctors for you to take their temperature, tell them you don't do that. But you'll be glad to look at what might be ailing them. Y'all help me welcome them as the docs of the day. Thank welcome you. to the Senate. Appreciate what you do, doctor. Senator Marsburg, Senator Hutto. Mr. President, um, in light of the questions and at the request of the author of the bill, um, we're going to, I'm going to move to carry this over so we can discuss that issue of uh, sundown, and uh, uh, Senator from Pickens is okay with that. So I would move to just carry over the bill so we can work Senator, this out. Senator Marsburg moves to carry over the bill. Senator from Darlington. Real, hold that. I have an amendment. You withdraw your yeah. Senator from Marsburg, you withdraw your motion to carry it over. Is my amendment on the desk, Mr. President. Senator from Darlington, no amendment yet, authored by you. But not by you. Well, I think they're bringing it to the to the desk now. The bill. Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Tutto moves to carry over the bill. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Bill's carried over. Now, bottom of page five, Senate Bill 40. Senate Bill 40. What will we read? It's a bill relating to the right of municipalities to establish on street parking facilities to provide that municipalities may not establish or alter parking facilities on any state highway facility without prior approval of the Department of Transportation. Question is, third reading of the bill. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The bill is given third reading. Page six now, bottom of the page, Senate Bill 425. Clerk will read. This is a bill by act that adds a section to the code to authorize banking institutions to decline certain financial transaction requests in cases of suspected financial exploitation of vulnerable adults and to define necessary terms. Explanation has been requested. Senator Macon, Senator Young is recognized. So let me um, just 
give some brief explanation on this bill. Um, we amended it last week. What the bill does is it addresses the issue of financial ex exploitation by providing protections for financial institutions and investment advisors if they pause or refuse transactions, if they reasonably believe that a vulnerable adult or a senior citizen is being exploited. It also provides appropriate reporting requirements and protections for disclosing evidence to appropriate parties. The intent of the legislation is straightforward, and that is if a financial institution, a broker dealer, an investment advisor reasonably believe that a vulnerable adult is being exploited, the qualified individual can report the act, that exploitation and be shielded from immunity only with regard to the potential liability for reporting the abuse and for delaying the transaction. We adopted an amendment last week that also clarified the situations in which there would be potential liability, and we mirrored sections that already existed in existing law in the Securities Act at Title 35, Section or Chapter 1, Section 501, as well as um, Chapter uh, or Section 35, Chapter 1, Section 603 and 604. Senator from Donington, Senator Malone. Senator from Greenville, Senator Corbin, what purpose do you rise? Senator, you for a question? Yes. Who does? So, Senator, what's the determining factor as to, is that onus put on the bank or the financial advisor or the person seeking assistance? H how does it work in practicality? If the, if, the, if the bank or the financial advisor suspects that there's, um, that someone's trying to take advantage of the a vulnerable adult, then this will allow them to slow down the transaction for a period of time so that there can be further looking into or investigation into it to make sure that it's a legitimate transaction. But, but who makes that determination as to whether they're suspect? Would that be the financial institution? Yeah, the financial institution, whether it's the teller at the bank or the financial advisor, this will allow them to slow it down if they suspect there's some kind of wrongdoing and not have it, have liability for that. Um, the reason I ask, Senator, as you know, my mother was in a bad car accident and my brother and I had to take over her finances when she was, you know, in, in, in ICU for weeks and weeks. And I'm just wondering how this might affect those type situations where somebody is legitimately trying to help someone and then I don't want any impediments. It's, it's not, it, 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 this should not impact the situation that you are describing with you and your mother and your brother, this is where there is um, what appears to be something that's not a kosher uh, uh, transaction that's being sought at the bank or at the financial advisor's office with respect to someone's but that decision, um, Senator, as to whether or not it's kosher or not, that lies with the bank or the this, financial planner. Th this allows them to slow down the process just for a short period of time so that if they need to do some further checking to make sure it's legitimate, what's they can the maximum, do that. What's the maximum amount of time they can slow it down? I think it's, um, I think it's, I think it's two days or, okay, just a couple I can't remember of in the, um, I wasn't on the subcommittee. I was on the full committee and I offered to explain it because I was offering the amendments. Um, okay. There are other questions? I have several people standing. Uh, you completed your question, Senator Greenville. Mr. President, the uh, member of the subcommittee clarified that it was like two to three days was all it could be held up, so I'm satisfied with my questions. Okay. Senator from Kershaw, Senator Gustafson, what purpose uh, do you have? Unanimous write? consent to add my name as a co-sponsor of this bill. Mr. Jackson, any nine so ordered, Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Stevens, what purpose do you rise? For a question. Yes. He does. Senator, is, is there a trigger of of a financial amount, or is there a trigger of, of a number of instances where someone, maybe other than the, the immediate family or someone who is on that uh, paperwork, can actually make a uh, withdrawal or checks written? You said, is there a trigger? Like, what, I mean, yeah. if, if there's a uh, threshold amount in the yeah, account? What prompts uh, the teller or the, or the uh, bank official to say, hey, there's something that's going on wrong here? And I'm asking, is it, is it a, a specific amount as it relates to monetary 
there's, it, it, the language of the bill says that if the financial institution reasonably believes that the financial exploitation of a vulnerable adult has occurred or may occur, then the financial institution may, but is not required, to decline or place on hold any transaction involving the account of the vulnerable adult, an account in which the vulnerable adult is a beneficiary, or the account of the person who is suspected of engaging in the financial exploitation of the vulnerable adult. But as I understand it, there's no language in the bill that sets a threshold amount of money that would be required to be in an account before this would uh, go into effect. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does, but it, it still leaves some uh, things unclear in my mind. I, I can just recall uh, going out of town a couple of years ago. Uh, I didn't notify my small hometown bank that I was going, and when I got to where I was, uh, my destination, I could not make a withdrawal because uh, it was out of state. Uh, so, you know, it brings back to my mind, uh, what is the, the thing that would make that teller, uh, you know, prompt them to, hey, we need to do something about this, this account or, or something that's, that's not right here. I just wish there was some uh, uh, clearer language as to what is actually the, the trigger behind uh, the action that would be taken by the financial institution. What, I mean, are you saying that, you've, that you had somebody do this to you when you went out of state somewhere? I, mean, what, what are you, I didn't understand. No, sir. You. When I went out of state, and I'm at a, at a small town bank, okay? And when they see something strange, they put a hole on your account. I went out of town, didn't notify them I was going, and when I went, I was in Las Vegas. Uh, no, I wasn't gambling, but I was in Las Vegas. When I went to take out a couple of dollars out of my account, it was, it stopped. I, I couldn't do anything because it was out of state. But, my, you know, my concern is wherever you are, wherever these, these adults are, is there someone in that bank is going to, to know them or know that, you know, there may be some shady deals going on here. Uh, I, I, I'm just looking for something that looks like a trigger that will prompt them to, you know, to, to, to slow down their account for two days or what have you. Understanding that there was some testimony at the subcommittee level that the financial, that, that the trigger could be different for different people's accounts. For example, if you had someone who regularly has transactions that occur in their account that are somewhere between $50 and $200, there wouldn't be necessarily anything that looks unusual about that. But if someone then came in and tried to make a, f a five to $10,000 transaction on that account and, it, and, it, and they were accompanied by someone who was, um, somewhat suspicious to the teller, then that might be a trigger. Yeah, that's, and, that's you, what I'm, and if you had another situation where someone regularly is transacting uh, uh, transactions that are five to $10,000 on a regular basis, then you know, a, an additional five to $10,000 transaction on that account holder's account might not be a trigger for that particular account holder. So there's not a threshold trigger in the statute because of it could be a different set of facts or scenario for different account holders. Uh-huh. And, so, and so, I, trust me, I understand exactly what you're saying, uh, and, but, but I'm just looking for, for that uh, distinction of, you know, $5,000, whatever. But, but thank you, uh, Senator, for your explanation. Thank you, Mr. President. So another, one other thing is that I was informed that at the subcommittee level, there was also testimony that um, the financial institutions train their staff and employees on what's, what red flags to look for, to, for where there might be a fraud um, or fraudster involved who's trying to steal money from somebody's account. Thank you, sir. Senator from Darlington, Senator Malloy, what purpose do you rise? See if the Senator from taking with you. Yes. No question. Senator, what, what happens in this situation when there is a person who has a power of attorney, and let's just say a sister and brother, 
that one has a power of attorney for a relative and then one goes in and, and, and on behalf of the power of attorney for that person, um, that they then ask for a transaction. And then the other one who objects to or contests the power of attorney on behalf of that person, because it's that person's acting in fact, still on that person's account. Can the bank hold that? Can the bank hold that um, um, transaction in this situation? So, um, Senator, if I, can, if I can, let me let me back up, make sure I understand the law school question. Okay. <laughs> I'm not All trying right, to give so, a law school so, question, okay. but you know, but, so, I, but, let, but, let me, but, let, but let me back up and give you a, a preface. Many times, as you will see, is, is that you learn this in trust and estates, and they say that um, blood is thicker than water. That's the first thing in probate. Then they say, but money is thicker than blood. You heard that before, right? I have. Okay, and so when you have two family members that may be going over it, and somebody has a power of attorney, can, can the one that does not have the power of attorney stop it, and the bank says, you reasonably... I want, you to, I want you to reasonably hold this because I don't believe mom was competent whenever she did the power of attorney. Can they hold the transaction then? So you're saying that the, the agent under the durable power of attorney goes to the bank and asks that the money be moved out of the account and that there's another sibling who's not the agent on the, um, under the power of attorney who then goes to the bank and says, don't move the money. Correct. Can they not move it? Well, I think under those, I would think that under that set of facts, if there's a dispute, that the bank could slow it down and do some additional checking into it. But the to bank's verify. not the court. I'm sorry. The bank is not the court. Is the issue. And so, what, and so what what all this all this does is allow them to slow it down before there's a the money leaves at before um, before it gets out of the barn. Um, and they're not, and there won't be liability for them to slow it down if they reasonably suspect there's something that's not kosher. So now, at the same time, there, we've added language in it that says that if 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 they um, materially aid or abet a fraud by letting the money go out of the account, then there can be li civil liability for that. So who are we doing this for? Are we doing it for that vulnerable adult? Or are we doing this for a bank? Yeah, this is this is intended to protect the. the I mean, really, both the fi the financial institution that's trying to look out for the the account holder if they suspect there's wrongdoing, and the account holder, uh, him or herself. Do we have any vulnerable adults appear before the committee? I wasn't on the subcommittee. Does anyone on the subcommittee know um, whether vulnerable adult appeared before the subcommittee? A one on their behalf. There were there was somebody from DSS that testified on behalf of um, of, of, of sure uh, you know from the vulnerable adult uh, division at DSS and and just for, for background again I shared all this with everyone on Thursday the Attorney General's office has been very involved um, its con consumer division has been very involved in working on this language and promoting this bill as a way to protect South Carolinians and try to. Um, prevent people from being taken advantage of, um, and the South Carolina Bankers Association has also been involved. Sure, in and we're for, and we're for protecting vulnerable adults, but I think that there are sufficient ways to protect banks. And so, who do we give civil liability protection to? The bank. The financial institution is protected with regard to the decision. Um, um, only with regard to the potential liability for reporting the abuse um, and or for delaying the transaction. So we got That's some it. places in the code where we are giving folks protection from civil liability and, and, you, and we are copying those provisions in the code and we're going to give a bank protection from civil liability for holding somebody's money even if it was ultimately inaccurate. It's for a short period of time. I understand. Okay. And we've also added language that makes it very clear that if the bank or a, any other financial institution or the broker dealer or the agent um, materially aids or abets um, the, the fraud, then there, are, or there is um, a civil liability that can, can apply. Is this bill on second reading or third reading? It's on third reading. Okay. Can we, can we carry it over and let me look at that civil liability provision again? Okay. 
Thank you. Senator so from Darlington, move to carry over Senate Bill 425. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Bill's carried over. Middle of page seven now, Senate Bill 296. Clerk will read. The bill amending the code. Relating to the Department of Motor Vehicles issuance of golf cart permits and the operation of golf carts along the state highways to provide that a municipality of a certain size and population may adopt an ordinance that allows for the operation during non-daylight hours of golf carts. Question is, Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? Can someone explain the difference in this bill and the one we just spent a half an hour on? Explanation has been requested, Senator from York, Senator Clymer. Senate, um, at the risk of incurring wrath for revisiting our golf cart conversation, this is another golf cart bill, one that we passed with all but one vote uh, last week. It is extremely narrowly drawn, narrowly tailored to apply only to um, really a particular subdivision in York County and includes um, one particular center from Spartanburg's interest in, you know, daylight hours and so on and so forth, all the safety protocols that are in current law. I would also note that the Senate passed this bill uh, overwhelmingly in the prior session. Senator from Newberry, Senator Calmer, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, see if Senator from York would yield for a question. I'd be, I'd be happy to. All right, so Senator, this one uh, agrees with, um, that, that allows it d during non-daylight hours. The other one only allowed it during uh, nine to five, I no, believe it was, I it, if I remember correctly. Within, I can't remember if it's half an hour or an hour. And so the nature of their problem in TGK is it is a, a peninsular community. It's basically a gated community without a gate. Everybody lives in a pretty tight quarters and they have softball fields, soccer fields, food and beverage and so on and so forth, all in close proximity to their houses. And so when they're taking their child to the softball game. Sometimes the softball game runs long, and they just want to be able to get home from the softball game. That, that's, that, provided that's, they've got uh, lights. Correct. Correct. Okay. Lights, all the other requirements. Uh, in, and in the and let me ask you, can you assure us that if we pass this, that that does not supersede uh, the bill that we just passed, which uh, shortens the number of hours and, and has other requirements on it also. This bill is drawn so narrowly as to apply only to uh, that particular community. Okay. Question is, third reading of the bill. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The bill is given third reading. Bottom of page <coughs> seven now, excuse me. Senate Bill 236. Clerk will read. They were laid to pooling precincts in municipal elections so as to provide that any precinct containing 3,000 or more voters, an increase from 500 or more voters having its own polling place, that the total number of registered voters in the municipal pool precincts cannot exceed 3,000, an increase from 1,500. Question is, third reading of the bill. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. You're given third reading. Page 8 now, Senate Bill 435. Clerk will read. Bill to authorize the Director of the Department of Insurance to issue a limited lines travel insurance producer license. Question is, third reading of the bill. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The bill is given third reading. Page 9 now, Senate Bill 499. Clerk will read. Bill to enact the South Carolina Election Commission Restructuring Act and adds a section to the code, provide that the President of the Senate, Speaker of the House, have the right to intervene and have standing on behalf of their respective bodies and actions that challenge the validity of an, ele of an election law, an election policy, or the manner in which an election is conducted. Question is, third reading of the bill. Oh, Senator from Charleston, Senator Kempson, what purpose do you rise? E explanation. Explanation has been requested on Senate Bill 499. Senator from Hedgefield, Senator Massey. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is the bill that we spent some time talking about last week dealing with the Election Commission and the Executive Director of the Election Commission to ensure that there would be Senate confirmation of um, all the Commission appointees and the Director. Senator from Charleston, what purpose, what purpose do you rise? Uh, Senator, you have for a question? Yes. Senator, uh, I was not in chambers. Uh, I believe, was this taken up on Thursday? I, th I thought it went very easy. Uh, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we did this last Wednesday. Okay. Do you mind if I carry this bill over just, uh, you can get back to it today just so I can. 
Thank you. Happy to do that. Thank you. Senator Kempson moves to carry over Senate Bill 499. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The bill's carried over. Bottom of page now, nine now, Senate Bill 351. Clerk will read. Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? Move to carry over till tomorrow. Senator Martin moves to carry over Senate Bill 351. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The bill's carried over. Second reading bills now. Page 13, bottom of the page, Senate Bill 628, amendments on the desk. Clerk will publish the amendment. Senator Cash proposes the following amendment. It amends the bill, page 7, strikes line 16 and inserts section 5. This act takes effect upon approval of the governor and is repealed June 30th, 2024. Senator from Anderson, Senator Cash, what purpose do you rise? Is this the pharmacy bill? Yes. No, I just... Uh, Withdraw that amendment. Is an objection? Hear none so order. Amendments withdrawn. Further amendments. Further amendments. Clerk will publish the next amendment. Amendment number three by Senator Cromer amends the bill. Page four strikes the line from Newberry. Senator Cromer. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd be recognized. Senator Cromer is recognized on the amendment. Mr. President, uh, we're waiting on a, an amendment to be proposed to us from uh, one of our folks out in the lobby, so I would move to carry over at this time. Senator Newberry moves to carry over Senate Bill 620, 628. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 401 is now contested. No, in, uncontested. Senate Bill 401 is now uncontested. Committee amendment. Amendments on the desk. Committee amendment. Clerk will publish the committee amendment. The Finance Committee proposes the following amendment. Amends the bill by striking section one and inserting. Senator from Beaver, Senator Davis, what purpose do you rise? Uh, for purposes of explaining the uh, committee amendment and the underlying bill. Recognize, sir. Uh, members of the Senate, as, as you'll recall, some years ago, um, the General Assembly enacted Act 388, which placed certain uh, caps on the um, the millage rates that that counties could impose on an annual basis. This particular bill would provide an exception uh, to that Act 388 cap by allowing for a county, uh, by a majority vote of its members, to adopt a resolution to suspend the millage rate in order to increase the limitation for the limited purpose of supporting a fire protection district. Now, the fire district must have been created under Title IV, Chapter 19, or Title VI, Chapter 11. Uh, Title IV, Chapter 19 refers to the creation of fire protection districts. Um, Title VI, Chapter 11 refers to the creation of special purpose districts. Um, the committee amendment would uh, limit the right of a county to suspend that millage rate cap um, for a period of two years. In other words, from the date of the enactment of the ordinance until the second anniversary date of the ordinance, that would be the two-year window for which a county could suspend that cap for purposes of raising millage for those limited purposes for a fire protection district. After two years, they would no longer have that right. The, the idea here is to, uh, to give a county a one-time shot of truing up or getting their millage rates to the level that they think is necessary to support these, these fire protection services. And then subsequent to that, um, they would no longer be able to avoid the cap imposed by the Act 388. So it's a, uh, in, in summary, it's a, it's a one-time exception to the Act 388 millage cap in regard to uh, millage for fire protection districts upon a majority vote by an elected county council. Question is adoption of the committee amendment. Senator from Anderson, Senator Cash, what purpose do you rise? See if the senator would yield for a question. Sen senator yields. Yes. Senator, I just uh, want to ask a question. It's my understanding that in current law, uh, you, you could also in increase the millage beyond the rates imposed by Act 388, what, whatever the underlying law is, but you would have to do it by way of a referendum. Is that not the case? Is this not shifting the decision from a public referendum to to uh, be able to have this excess increase 
Is it not shifting it from a public referendum to the county council? Well, it certainly would empower a county council. I don't even know that under Act 388 that you could go and, uh, and, and circumvent the millage rate, appraisal rate um, requirements or caps that are placed. Um, now, there are certain provisions where you can have penny sales tax for capital projects or things of that nature that are by referendum. But I mean, but my recollection is that Act 388 cannot be superseded by a referendum, but I, but I stand corrected if, if, if that's not the case. I think uh, it's a hard cap. You, you may be correct. I, I, I was simply getting that from reading the summary of the bill that is, you know, provided as part of the bill. Senator from Greenville, Senator Corbin, what purpose do you rise? Would Senator yield for a question? Uh, he will. If, if I could, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting response from, from staff. Um, there, and under current law, if it's very small departments, um, but very narrow universe of, of, of departments that serve a very limited amount of area, that can be done by referendum. But that, that's in very limited circumstances. I was not aware of that Act 388 exception. But Senator yields to that's from Greenville, Senator Corbin. So, Senator, if this bill passes, it basically will give county council the ability to remove the uh, cap so that these fire departments can get caught up. Um, is there a limit as to what that millage can go up to? No, there's, there's not. I mean, the, the, the only limitation is it gives them a two-year window in which to do it, but there is nothing in the bill itself that would limit the amount of the millage increase. So it could go potentially... Extremely high, potentially. There is no limit in the, in the bill in regard to what they could raise the millage to. This would suspend the Act 388 cap for that two-year window upon a majority vote of the council. I understand, Senator. Um, and with respect to your bill, um, I've just, uh, for you and the body's knowledge, I've never voted for a tax increase nor allowing the ability to seek one. So. Um, that's where my position will be on the bill. Thank you. And from Berkeley, Senator Grooms, what purpose do you rise? Senator, to answer a question. Senator um, Yields. Um, earlier today, we had some discussions about golf carts, how it started with one little area and it kept growing and kept growing. Do you believe that if we move forward with this bill, we may have subsequent legislation at some other time? We need to make sure that our sheriff's department, they need some more vehicles. Can we? exempt them from 388 or if we want to build a, a library but we can't we need to get an exemption for our county library system and so forth and so on and so on or are we do you believe we could be opening the opening up act 388 through um bill after bill to weaken it and you know i remember the golf carts and we, we've got them expanded now I, I i don't want to be there next year and the year after i i we had some discussion of that, Senator, at the subcommittee level. Rather, as a matter of public policy, is it better to address, and I believe Senator Turner has been chairing a committee to look at, I think it's Senator Turner, to look at the tax code in general for some overall updates. Um, and it was decided at the subcommittee level that the need in some of these rural communities in regard to these fire protection services, that, that the need was so acute that we went ahead and said, okay, we're gonna provide for this exception. As to future requests, they would, I guess, be judged on their own merits as to, as to how compelling the case could be. But this is the first step, I, I met. I, I'm, I'm not, we can't predict yeah. the future, but yeah. it seems like we're, we're setting a precedent right now that if your county council can't budget you within the resources available, go to the legislature, get an exemption, and then you can get what you want. I can I can just I can just see it I can see it now I can see it now we sure do we sure do need that new library we, we we man if we could just upgrade those new cars and my gosh the office building why don't we replace it only if we could go to the legislature and seek an exemption Thank Senator you. may be prescient Senator from Dorchester Senator Bennett what purpose do you rise would Senator yield just for a quick question sure Go Senator ahead. yields Thank you Thank you Mr. President Senator, do you think this is an appropriate time to pick up on a couple of the comments here? But I think it's an appropriate time to uh, reiterate to the public uh, and to this body uh, and to everybody involved in South Carolina tax policy that Act 388 
is clearly the worst piece of legislation ever passed by this body. Mm, I don't know about the, uh, the Base Load Review Act. Maybe second, there. second worst, second worst. Okay. Um, but, ser but seriously, Senator, I, I think it was a terrible piece of legislation. And this issue, as well as the issues that Senator from Berkeley brings up about potential future problems, only um, adds to that problem. And I, and I think my personal, my personal opinion, and just want to see if, if you agreed, Senator, with, um, is the correct answer to all these things is we have to take a comprehensive look at tax reform and tax policy in the state of South Carolina. I, I, I think that's absolutely right. And, and that tax policy drives a number of other policy decisions we have to make, such as funding of schools. I mean, it's all kind of interrelated. But you're, you're absolutely right that we need to look at it holistically. Senator from Berkeley's point is that by allowing one chip away here, we're going to maybe approach this on an ad hoc basis as opposed to a comprehensive basis. I can only say that we considered that at subcommittee. Um, the author of the bill, Senator Gustafson, made a good case in regard to the acute need in regard to the fire protection sure. services. So we felt comfortable moving it out on that basis. And I appreciate that, Senator. And I, I would just, you know, close by saying, you know, the one, the, the problems with this piecemeal uh, approach to these taxes, whether or not, I, and I think most, would you agree, Senator, that most of the of the things that come in front of us that we have to make changes. Uh, piecemeal are critical. They're, they're important needs, and this is certainly a critical need, and there will be other, and there have been hundreds of thousands of, of these critical needs that we've taken up piecemeal, and that's really what has gotten us to the point now, the problem that we have today is 50 years of piecemeal tax policy center. Fair statement. Senator from Pickens, Senator Rice, what purpose do you write? Will the Senator yield for question? Senator, Senator yeah. Yields. Uh, you said earlier that this applies only to a select group of fire districts. Is that correct? Yeah, there, there, are, two, there are two titles, um, Title IV, Chapter 19, and Title VI, Chapter 11. The former refers uh, to the creation or empowers a, a, the creation of fire protection districts. Um, Title VI, Chapter 11 refers to the empowerment of counties to create special purpose districts. So the universe of districts for which millages could be increased are limited to those particular sections. Do you have a list of those districts? I do not personally have a list. I mean, there, there'll be predominantly the, the more rural areas, um, but we could get you a list, Senator. I feel confident. I mean, I, I'd like to see a list and understand the need of those districts, because I, I understand there may be a need in a certain district, but I am concerned about opening a can of worms here. And, you know, is there any other way other than the legislation that they can either restructure their district uh, in such a fashion that maybe they can get the revenues that they need to provide the proper service? I guess it, it's, it, I'm, I handed a note here in regard to you could convert from a volunteer to a paid fire service, but, but I, what I would do at the appropriate time um, would be moving for the adoption of the committee amendment to suspend roll call on second and carry over all amendments on third. So, and I understand there may be concerns and the bill doesn't get third reading because of those concerns, but at least at that point it would be in a posture if we can answer all the questions that senators have raised, it would be possible for it to, to cross over before the deadline. But I'll make that at the appropriate motion, at the appropriate time, and I'll try to find out the answer to your question, Senator from Pickens. All right, thank you. Senator from Anderson, Senator Gamble, what purpose do you ride? President, see if Senator would yield. Senator yields. Uh, Senator, I think in full committee it was maybe brought up this, this bill didn't apply to special fire departments that were special purpose tax districts or were created after, not legislatively, after 1962, but I think legislative council since that time has had an opportunity to look at the legislation, and I think it does apply. It, it does. It, it would apply to the creation of any fire protection district under uh, Title IV, Chapter 19, or any special purpose district created under Title VI, Chapter 11. Um, but to the Senator from Pickens' point, we can get a list of the counties for, for, for whom that's applicable. Thank you, Senator. If we could get that list, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, Senator from New Bay, Senator Cromer, what purpose do you write? Let's see if Senator for yield for a question. Senator Yield. Senator, what most of the counties do, and those in my district, um, they would get a have a vote on a county tax, one cent sales tax referendum, and use them for special purpose projects. 
And I just wonder if the author of this bill had explored that possibility. You have any idea if they looked at the I don't, one cent sales tax? Increase? I don't know, but that may be what the senator from Anderson was getting at in regard to a referendum somehow providing a source of funds for these purposes. Um, I, I, that was not discussed at, at subcommittee, the, the special sales tax for that purpose. Senator Mulconey. Senator Alexander, what purpose do you rise? Thank you, Mr. President. Let's see if the senator deal for a question. Senator yes. Yields. To further pick up on that, doesn't the ability of a fire department uh, ha having the ability to have the correct uh, equipment make a difference on the ISO rating? So in essence, if a fire department does not have the appropriate uh, equipment, in essence, someone's fire insurance on their home or other structures could be going up far greater than what the increase would be to keep their equipment up to date. That would be one of the incidental uh, effects of this would be perhaps to improve the ISO rating of the, of the fire district and therefore the premiums. Senator from Berkeley, Senator Groves, what purpose do you rise? See if Senator answer a question. Senator Yields. Would this bill be a vehicle or would it be germane to have an exemption for our school districts? To get around I, that. I guess that would be subject to whether or not an amendment was an improper enlargement or, you know, not materially conforming with the underlying purpose of the bill. So I don't, I don't know. That would be the ruling of the, of the chair. I wonder if we got a ruling from the chair that you could not give an exemption for the school districts, but the House decided to put one on there and then it came back. Was, a lot of us fought really hard to keep the property taxes low, and I, I really hate sending a Trojan horse over to the House. My, my understanding of the rule is that it relates to the underlying bill as filed in the Senate, not as amended by the House. But again, I would defer to my friends who are more versed in the rules than I. Senator from Darlington, Senator Malloy, what purpose do you rise? Senator, in 2006, when we passed, uh, when they, they passed uh, what was ultimately Act 388, were you here then? No, well, I was downstairs in the basement. Right. And so, <laughs> that doesn't necessarily classify as here. That was nearby. And so, so the, um, so, and there's a two-thirds requirement in changing Act 388, correct? Two-thirds requirement in terms of if we pass it, it's vetoed and sent back up here and we have no, to vote on an override? If we or? ever changed it, if we ever changed it, it was a two-thirds vote requirement. Did you realize that? I, I know that was in the Heritage Act. The Heritage Act says that. But yeah. I did not know that was a two-thirds requirement in Act 388. And in either event, I don't know if that's constitutional, quite frankly, because I don't know if you can bind a subsequent General Assembly to more than a majority vote. You're giving somebody some hints now. The, um, so, so does this legislation mirror that and reflect it? They required that because we are changing it for the exceptions and if I recall, you may want to end up checking with staff. I don't know if Grant or any of those guys would give you a, a nod that we have to end up having um, a two-thirds vote to end up amending or changing Act 388, which I agree with you is unconstitutional, and we'll see how the Heritage Act go. We'll see. Uh, staff is, is telling me that, in fact, there is a two-thirds amendment requirement in Act 388, Senator from Darlington. So I, I, I thought I was here. And... The thing is, is that being here, the question is, is that, that seeing that there was a uh, two-thirds vote, and I am of the belief that it's unconstitutional as well. And so, but my question is, is that does your, does the amendment that we have, I mean the bill that we have in place, really accept to Act 388 if it does not have that two-thirds vote in it, understanding that we have not had a court ruling on 388 as of yet? What does it do to your, to your bill? Um, first of all, it's not my bill. I'm the subcommittee chairman. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, you know, second of all, I, I would think that would be a, a matter for the courts to determine. I mean, I, I think that this body could pass on a majority vote and the House could, you know, concur or, or on a majority vote. Uh, and then somebody could bring an action, a declaratory judgment in, in the Court of Common Pleas saying, wait a minute, you've gone ahead and you've amended Act 388 by a majority vote. And 
I think what would happen in that case is a trial judge would say one General Assembly can't bind a subsequent General Assembly to a higher threshold than a majority, but I, I don't think it's necessary for us to act uh, on this floor in accordance with the two-thirds in order for it to be effective. That's just my opinion. And I think, and I, and I think that that's probably what the Senate has done in the past um, because we've had some, some interesting things. For example, um, death penalty on a criminal sexual conduct case we've had, and, and, and it's like, you know, we don't care what the court says, it, that you don't have death penalty if, if it doesn't involve a murder, um, but we'll pass it anyway just so we can end up getting, getting a vote. And so the question becomes now, I think you may be correct by just saying that, that one, that we can pass it, maybe that, it, that our bill will accept to it regardless, and what you're creating is a conflict in what we have as far as Act 388. Um, and the, and the question is, is that if Act 388 is unconstitutional, um, then this bill wouldn't necessarily require the two-thirds vote. I guess that's what you're saying, correct? Well, and, and, and just thinking out loud, Senator, it may be that a parliamentary inquiry of the desk as to, as to given the Act 388's requirements, what is the voting threshold in order for a bill to pass this body? I mean, I guess that would be, I, I forgot that in my, a hypothetical I gave you earlier, I would suspect sure. that it might be subject to a parliamentary inquiry. Well, you know that the, uh, the desk is not going to give advisory opinions, and so I think that we would be left up to ourselves to end up proceeding um, basically on the majority vote. And I think that it would be interesting to take a look at Act 388 after the fact. And I, I, am, um, I agree with you that, that the difficulty is two-thirds vote where we bind another assembly is problematic, and I think it's something that, that, that the body has take a strong look at, but I just want to bring it to your attention and make it public for once. As I go back and look at the votes on this issue now, it's the folks that voted against it and the votes that voted for it, um, that um, it does require a two-thirds vote. So we, we, can, we listen to what the senator from Dorchester says is a bad piece of legislation. Where's the place? There's a way to fix it. And there's a way to fix it in the courts and in here. Senator from Charleston, Senator Campson, what purpose do you ride? Senator Campson. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and Senator from um, Dorchester, he's, I, I wanted to hear this, but um, 388 does have some serious problems. It's really a blunt instrument to address what was, what was a very serious problem and will continue to be a serious problem, particularly if we begin to erode away at 388 piecemeal. And this is the serious problem. If you haven't noticed, I've said it many times, we don't have to bribe people to move to paradise, they come in here anyway. And the impact of them coming here anyway is a dramatic increase in property taxes. The growth doesn't pay for itself, we pay for the growth. Those who are growed upon pay for the growth. There's a gazillion studies that demonstrate that. Why? Because you get, what do you need? You need schools, you need police stations, you need fire stations, you need um, government services. And when you have massive in-migration, you have to build all those local government facilities. That's number one. And number two, it also drives the value of real property up. And so you have people who've lived in homes for decades, and they're hit with massive property tax increases. This is why, we, this is why the 388 came about, and I think it's important for members to understand this, because if you just do away with 388, you're going to have constituents. I would... I had a constituent in 2006, an 83 year old widow who'd lived in her home for 42 years, did not even have air condition in downtown Charleston. $35,000 property tax bill, annual. Today, that property tax bill without 388 would probably be 75,000, 80,000. Why does she have that kind of property tax bill? Well, because half the investment bankers in 
New York decided it'd be cool to own a house down in historic Charleston, down on the Battery or near the Battery, down below Broad Street. That'd be cool. And so this, this woman who was a lawyer, her husband was a general surgeon, people that normally could afford to, wouldn't get taxed out of their homes, literally was about to get taxed out of her home. Because why? The investment banker worth $500 million or, or a billion and a half dollars decided, I'm going to go buy houses down there. And so what do you do when you have a reassessment? You appraise the other houses in the neighborhood, the prices go up, literally being taxed out of her home. That happened at an upper echelon of income. That also happened, was happening at lower, at all echelons of income. But I'm just telling you, if we, if we just do, 388 should have been drafted, passed differently. I tried to get it to be passed differently, but this, is, this, was, this was sausage making. This was the best thing that we could get, the only thing we could get passed. But I want you to know that if you just do away with 388, you will have massive property tax increases on residents, on personal, home, private homes, personal residents in, in everybody's district, and it will be massive. And, the, and we, are, we, are at, we are at a... I thought we'd never see hot, more um, robust growth in South Carolina than we've had in recent years. We have just seen it step up dramatically because people are fleeing the Northeast and the Midwest, high tax states, states um, that, and, and they're coming here. And COVID has accelerated that. Like COVID has accelerated every dynamic that was already in place pretty much. And that's one of them. And so, we can't just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote against this um, because I don't think that we should start chipping away at 388. I think we need to look at it with a holistic reform in mind, but we also have to keep in mind the problem that 388 attempted to address. It should have been done differently. I tried to make it differently, done differently and failed, but if we just pull the plug on that, you will see $35,000 property tax bills all over this state, not just in downtown Charleston. You will, I'll see 85, 100,000, 120,000 annual property tax bills in Charleston down, <laughs> down there below Broad is what you'd see there. Senator from Spartanburg, so, Senator Martin. We'll so that's, that's that's the problem 388 attempted to address. I'm against piecemeal rescission of parts of it bit by bit, like the golf cart legislation, because we're really playing with fire and we don't understand the impact it may have. Senator Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? See if the Senator from Charleston would yield for a question. He will. Yes. Senator, did you know that you just sparked my thinking as well? And the one thing that I thought about did you know if, if it was eliminated and went all the way back, there would be a lot of homes that receive no benefit from Act 388 that would never know Act 388 was reversed. So I think you would have a lot, it would be a lot of differences across the state if that happened. The people that were already under a certain amount on their home, like mine, who never experienced the benefit of 388 personally on a owner-occupied home because you're already exempt anyway under the Homestead Act. I think it would create a lot of confusion. Well, can you talk to that a little bit about that, about the thresholds, the 388, that were already there prior to 388, then if it were reversed? Well, the threshold on 388 is a 15% um, increase in your, in your five-year reassessment. It can't, the, the assessed value can't increase more than 15%, and also you're taking the, you took the school operating portion of the property tax off of primary residence. And that's where there was really kind of a misfit because that's where the students come from is the primary residence. But, um, but you, you know, you, got, you get past what could get past, but I'm just telling you that there is a huge, there was a huge problem. That problem would be even greater today because people think, people think that, well, then, you know, you build the next subdivision and it's going to pay for itself. That's great because our taxes are going down. That's nobody's experience. 
And the studies have demonstrated that's not the case because you need to build, local government needs to build the schools, the fire stations, the police stations, um, the public works departments. They need to put in sewer systems and water systems and they need to do all that. And it, and, and it ends up being borne by those that are moving here, but also probably even more so by those who are already living here. And so when you, when you have a state that's experiencing massive growth, growth like we are, it really exacerbates that. And so that's, that's why it passed. That's why we dealt with that. But, and, I'm, and I think it needs to be changed, uh, but I don't, I'm not for changing it piecemeal like this. Senator from Greenville, Senator Corbin, what purpose do you ride? Senator Yield for a question. Yes. Well, Senator, did you know that many of us in this chamber consider you somewhat of a constitutional scholar? Did you know that? <laughs> Not all. I, I, I know that now, Senator. <laughs> Senator, what happens to your property if you don't pay your property taxes? Well, your property can be sold at auction, so ultimately. It's confiscated by the government and right. taken from you and, and sold. Right. In your opinion, is that constitutional? <laughs> um, yes, I think that is, unfortunately, I'd say, but I think it is. But I, d I do think this, also, this discussion about the two-thirds vote, it's not our prerogative to determine what is constitutional or not. A court would have to strike that down until such time as that is struck down. We are subject to a two-thirds two vote. If it's, sure. if it's in the, um, on 388 and the Heritage Act and other acts. Senator from Kershaw, Senator Gustafson, what purpose do you rise? Uh, if the Senator will yield and allow me to uh, speak to this bill when you're uh, finished with the question and answer period. I think Senator from Georgetown has a question. Senator from Georgetown, what purpose do you rise? Here I'll on. yield. Senator, you piqued my interest. Um, <clears throat> You and I have had some of these discussions before about the unprecedented growth on the coast and how to deal with this. Um, would you agree, Senator, if I was to come to you and I said, Senator, I'd like to bind your cruise line, that I would need to provide you with a capital contribution of some kind? You would. Oh, okay. A pretty big one, too, is a what I would. Pretty big one. Pretty big I'd try one. to negotiate anyway. <laughs> right. So if a... If a person, an unidentified person from the Northeast comes to coastal South Carolina and plants his or her roots and takes advantage of the roads and the bridges and the utilities and the infrastructure that all of us have built over the course of the last 50 years, should they not have to put up the same capital contribution that I would if I were to take advantage of all of Well, if things? that doesn't happen, guess who's paying for that? those capital needs? It would be you and me, the wouldn't it, Senator? People that are already living here. Is and, and isn't it worse that you and I, Senator, have to, you and I and all of our constituents and everybody else that's lived here for the last 50 years, isn't it worse because we actually have to pay for those roads, those bridges, those utilities in advance of people moving here? Isn't that correct, Senator? Yeah. You know, Senator, the same dynamic was in the Base Load Review Act, which is one of the reasons, the primary reason that got me first against it, and then I studied it more and a lot of reasons, but, but one of them was that it shifted the cost of new generating capacity from those who create that demand in the future to those who have already paid for their own generating capacity and paying for it again for those who don't even live here yet. And, and the way that happened under the Base Load Review Act was because before the Base Load Review Act, you could not charge a customer for generating capacity until the plant was online operating producing energy. But the Base Load Review Act changed that because these were nifty, off the shelf, nuclear plants is what the way they were sold and um and so we started pay as you go which means i'm paying people citizens of south carolina paying for generating capacity for people who don't even live here yet right okay that's what got me first opposed to it and then you look further it also shifted the cost from share from uh, shareholders and bondholders to rate payers shifted the risk to them and a lot of other reasons but um that a similar dynamic is at play here in the real estate tax so, so arena. It's the point it, that i'm making in, instead of piecemealing it wouldn't it behoove us to 
come up with this way of providing a capital contribution from newcomers, for instance, a statewide impact fee that exempted anybody who's already paid into the system, and use that to redistribute across the state to, in contrary to 388, like for education, for roads, for bridges? Well, Senator, those are the type of things that ought to be contemplated during the reform, during the, as you reform it, but you can, only con you can only deal with those issues if you do it holistically. Right. And I'm, that's the main point I'm making. I think we do need to look at it, but it needs to be holistic, and it, you need to strive to place the cost where the need, where, where, place the cost where the demand for the new infrastructure comes from. For, 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 um, and, and so that's kind of what you're saying, but that's the way we need to do this. I mean, this would be the first time that we, we lift the veil, so to speak, and tweak 388, and um, I'm not for doing that, because we could be, even make exacerbate problems if we did that. Yeah, I'm, for, I'm for a reform, a more holistic reform like you're alluding to. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Senator Kershaw, Senator Gustafson is recognized on the bill. Senator Kershaw. Okay, first of all, I just want to thank the people who were here. Um, in hindsight, uh, Act 388 did create a lot of unintended consequences, but at the time, I completely understand why and how it came to be. I get that. And the property owners were very thankful for 388 at that time. Fortunately for us today in our decision making, this Bill 401 does not change at 388. It does not. What it does is it targets very specific fire districts and believe me, I wanted this to be a local bill, but it was impossible to write as a, a local bill because of the way the, um, our fire districts were set up. We tried that. So this is really in response to a fire crisis, and it was been labeled as such by our locals for years in Kershaw County because there's no way for them to uh, fund the fire district. They have looked at referendums. They, have, um, they currently have a $29 uh, fee that they have already uh, said that they will remove immediately should they be able to do this. Um, they had a two-year study to determine the needs and the readiness of the volunteer system, and that's the problem. This bill is going to help everyone in here who represents rural South Carolina. The people who elected me have been asking me for help for this since before I ran for office because they knew I was a community advocate. I've met with firefighters, I've met with uh, police chiefs, I've talked to um, elected officials, I've talked to uh, individuals. I, I, the law, the list is long and it has broad, has a broad um, scope of support. At 388 um, had unintended consequences. That is a fact. So 401 was written to provide the opportunity, not a mandate, not another mandate, but the opportunity for our local governments, our county councils, to finally be able to, to meet the needs of the people they serve because they know those needs best. County Council of Kershaw County knows the needs best of the people who live in County Council in, in Kershaw County. And what this bill does is it releases the shackles of 388 to allow them to look at the funding for the fire and do what they need to do to take care of the needs. We have this population growth. We do not have the business growth that matches it. With the population growth, as you know, as it's already been mentioned by several, you have increased road needs, increased um, school needs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, everybody expects to have good first responder needs. And because we have been traditionally, for a very long time, a volunteer part-time uh, fire response team for this county, we've suffered because we are moving into full-time fire, firefighters 
across the county because it is needed. And it directly affects the response time, directly. So I know we're talking about a lot of different things today, but today I'm talking about the needs of our people who live in rural areas and being able to get um, reached within a certain amount of time. Now, if you or I had a house fire, if you live in downtown Columbia or Charleston or another populated area, there's no problem. You know the firefighters, they're going to get there very quickly. If you are in Bishopville, South Carolina, Bishopville has a great fire department, by the way. If you're in certain areas of Kershaw County, your response times are not going to be as quick. If there is a direct correlation between full-time firefighters and response time. It's a difference between your house burning maybe 30% rather than 70% down to the ground. On the back of the materials that uh, were distributed to you is a real life situation that I found out about a couple years ago. It's one of the things I heard, um, you know, as, as just a regular person, I wasn't in office, I wasn't in politics. But we're talking about real human fatalities here. A five-year-old little boy died in a house, in a, in a car fire. He died. And, the, and the, uh, the outline of the timeline of all the calls made, I provided for you. That five-year-old boy did not have to die. And there is something we can do to help our rural districts today. It is an urgent need that was here way before I was. I was just willing to, to help move this along and, and approach one tiny part that we need so desperately today. Now I'm gonna show you something and it's pretty hard to believe it. It's a radio. The thing about funding fire is not just about hiring firefighters, it's also just maintaining. It's about keeping up with technology, which is required. The technology of firefighters and what they use in EMS and police, it becomes obsolete after seven or eight years. Now, when was that 388? 2008? It's 2021? And they've stretched it as far as they can do. They've done everything they can do to, to do what they can under the restraints of Act 388. This radio costs almost $5,000. And they can't just replace the firefighters. When they do it, they have to replace the whole system. That means the police, the EMS, and the firefighters. And there are 500 of these things in Kershaw County. It's a racket. It's a racket. It, we, I wish we could get them cheaper. We can't. This is what's required. And this will not be able to be used after 2021. That is why this is urgent. And this is why we should vote for this bill. Yes for 401, that means a yes for public safety. It means we're listening to our constituents and understanding the needs. It is a fiscal is issue, but it's a modernizing issue. It is at 388 issue, but it does not affect the law of 388. This isn't overturning it, it's giving it a small exception for a very small part of our state. That is, fire districts formulated, organized after 1962 under Title IV or Title VI. Kershaw County just did it very unusually. And we had all volunteers, we, it was an all volunteer service. So I, I, I'm, I have a lot more to say, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this. We spent the last year and a half and many years talking about the heroes of our communities. And I think we can all agree it includes doctors and nurses, first responders, emergency medical units, coroners, and firefighters. Those are our heroes. Today, we as a body have an opportunity to be their heroes and support them and support the funding of what is needed. It is not a mandate. It simply allows the munic municipality to adjust the millage one time in a two-year time period, and that's it. 
It's not unfettered taxation. It is solving an immediate problem. It is so, and it's meeting a need that is desperate. The, we can't compare this to go-karts. They have used V-SAFE grants, other grants, or living on grants. You can't get enough grants to provide all the modernization and technical upgrades that are needed. They've done the $29 fee on uh, land ownership, which is inequitable. Because if you don't, uh, because if you own 8,000 acres of land or a quarter of an acre, it's still $29. That's not right. So with that, um, ladies and gentlemen, I will entertain questions, and I and I hope that uh, this body understands the need for the for 401 for our local rural communities. It's not for the whole state. It's not for uh, you know. This isn't an opening the door to um, to other parts of 388. It's just looking at one tiny spot that will have an immediate an immediate positive impact to this state and to the people I serve in District 27, which includes Chesterfield, which is rural, Kershaw County, which is rural and being more urbanized every day in the bottom third of Lancaster County. Senator from Ori, Senator Hembry, will purposely rise. Unanimous consent request. That's your request, sir. Request that the words of the Senator from Kershaw be placed in the journal. Mr. Jackson, and none so ordered. Senator from Kershaw. I move that we uh, hold on question, just a moment. Question, question is adoption of the committee amendment. All in favor. Senator from Darlington, Senator from Lloyd, what purpose do you rise? Let's try to see if the Senate is relinquishing the floor. Uh, only if there are no questions. This completes my remarks. Thank you very much. Question is, adoption of the committee amendment. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment's adopted. There are no further amendments. Therefore, the question is, second reading of the bill as amended. Roll call is required. Senator from Charleston, what purpose do you rise? Roll call is required. Clerk will ring the bell. Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Martin. Parliamentary Martin. inquiry. State your inquiry, sir. Um, is there a fiscal impact on the desk? Desk is checking. There he is, Senator from Spartanburg. Thank you. Senator from Fairfield, Senator from Bring to us, uh, Central. Place your inquiry. Oh, pardon me, is the threshold vote two thirds? Because if I recall, the the Act 388 um, required the exemptions on Act 388 to end up having it. I'm just curious, is that, that do um, are, are we are we acknowledging a the threshold amount of vote? Two thirds is not required. Thank you. Meeting clerk will call the roll. <clears throat> Mr. Adams, no. Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. Allen, aye. Mr. Bennett, no. Mr. Campson, no. Mr. Cash, not voting, Mr. Clymer? No. Mr. Corbin? No. Mr. Cromer? No. Mr. Davis? Not voting, Mr. Fanning? Aye. Aye. Mr. Gambrell? Aye. Mr. Garrett? Aye. Mr. Goldfinch? No. Mr. Grooms? No. Mrs. Gustafson? Aye. Mr. Harputlian? Aye. Mr. Hembry? Aye. Mr. Hutto? Aye. Mr. Jackson? 
not voting, Mr. Kevin Johnson. Aye. Mr. Michael Johnson has leave. Mr. Kimbrell. No. Mr. Kempson. Aye. Mr. Leatherman has leave. Mr. Loftus. Mr. Loftus votes no. Mr. Malloy. Aye. Mr. Martin. No. Mr. Massey. No. Mrs. Matthews. Not voting, Mr. McElveen. Aye. Mr. McLeod. Aye. Mr. Peeler. No. no. Mr. Rankin. Rankin not voting, Mr. Rice. No. Mr. Sab. Aye. Mr. Scott. Not voting, Mrs. Sin has leave. Mr. Setzler. Aye. Mrs. Sheely. Aye. Mr. Stevens. Aye. Mr. Talley. No. Mr. Turner. No. Mr. Verdon. No. Mr. Williams. Aye. Mr. Young. No. All senators voted. Senator Scott votes aye. Senator Cash votes no. All senators voted. Senator Matthews votes aye. Last call, Senator Davis votes aye. Polls are closed. Senator, who's, Senator Rankin votes no. Last call, if all senators are voted. Polls are closed. Clerk will tabulate. By a vote of 22 to 20, the bill is given second reading. Turn your calendars, page 16 now. Sent from Edgefield, sent to Massey, will purposely rise. Mr. President, um, just a, I guess a point of personal interest, if I could be recognized for that. Um, Mr. President, recognize, uh, sir. Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? There's no objection to that unanimous consent request. <laughs> Mr. President, um, we have we have some finance budget subcommittees that are scheduled to meet this afternoon, and I understand in talking with those subcommittee chairmen that they really need to have those meetings in order to ensure that the full finance will be ready to meet next week. And we need full finance to be able to address the budget next week uh, so that we can remain on schedule for the rest of the month. Um, having said that, there are a number of bills on the uncontested calendar that we have not gotten to today. So uh, I think, Mr. President, what I'm going to ask is that we adjourn uh, so that those finance subcommittees can meet. However, in so doing that, uh, I everybody needs to understand tomorrow could be late uh, because we have a number of uncontested bills that are left. Some of those uncontested bills are going to engender debate like what we've had today. There are going to be questions about a number of those things, but we're going to have to work through the calendar at some point. Wednesday is typically a long day, but Wednesday tomorrow could be a long day in trying to get through some of those things. Um, so I I'm happy to to take questions. Minority questions. Leader, for what purpose do you have? To see, um, uh, see if he would yield for a question. Sure. He will. What, what would be the wisdom maybe of coming in at 11 tomorrow instead of 1? Because you, uh, I'm, I'm informed by the Senate from Richland that he's in his pajamas by 7. So uh, it, it could be a really long day unless we, <laughs> unless we, um, Consider maybe, and I, I understand that finance needs to meet, but is there a problem with trying to meet early tomorrow? Well, the problem with, the, there are already subcommittee and committees scheduled for but, the, the but whole But crossover the whole is only one time in the year, and those subcommittees could be rescheduled, I would suggest. Well, I, I um, there's one full committee meeting 
that's scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, and, and, and speaking with the chairman of that committee, he's, he's concerned about giving that up. Senator from Lexington, Senator Sessler, will purpose you rise. I have a unanimous consent request when we get to that point. Senator from Hitchfield, please get the center open. Senate will stand at ease for two minutes. Senate will come to order. All House bills tomorrow. Senator from Lexington, what purpose do you rise? I have a unanimous consent request. State your request, sir. My request is that on the next available day, the Senate adjourn in memory of Tom Farrell, who died this past weekend with CEO that had just retired of Dominion Energy. Without objection. Senator from Marion. Senator Williams, what purpose do you rise? Unanimous consent request. State your request, sir. To recall House Bill 3436. It's a road naming bill in Dillon County. Uh, after conferring with the uh, Chairman of Transportation, I'd like to recall that bill and place it on the calendar, please. Objection. Here, not so ordered. Senator from Berkeley. Senator Adams. <laughs> Unanimous consent, sir, on our last adjournment uh, day available. If we can adjourn in memory of Douglas Allen Burbage, please, who passed the COVID complications. Mr. Jackson, here none so ordered. Senator from Berkeley, Senator Grooms, what purpose do you rise? Unanimous consent to recall Senate Bill 728, a road naming bill from the Transportation Committee, uh, a road naming bill in Pickens County, and have it placed on the calendar. Senate to Senate seven to eight. There's an objection. Here not so order. Senator from Greenville, Senator Corbin, what purpose do you rise? Unanimous consent to go back to the local bill. On page two, seven eleven. Let's everybody just kind of simmer down just a little bit. I'll get to you. Senator from Darlington, Senator Malloy, what purpose do you rise? Yes. Senator, are you moving to go back to that bill on an uncontested basis? Yes. And that bill only? Yes. Thank you. There's an objection. Any non so ordered. Local bill, page two, Senate Bill 711. Mr. President, I'd like to explain the amendment. You recognize, sir. All the amendment does is isolate the area. We've already adopted the amendment. Okay. Sir. All the bill does is 100% in Greenville County, 100% in District 5. It's just naming a community. That's all it does. Move for passage. Question is, second reading as amended. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Bill is given second reading. Senator from Edgefield, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, um, it sounds like that for tomorrow, let me get some attention. Senator, will please come to order. 
Thank you. Conversation to outside. Sam from Edgefield. Mr. President, it sounds like for tomorrow that we need to meet at our regular time of 1 p.m. Um, and so I think that we're probably at a point now because of those budget subcommittees uh, that we probably are at a stopping point, as good of a stopping point as we're going to get. Um, hopefully, hopefully those subcommittees can make some progress because then for those of us who are not on those subcommittees, um, don't have a whole lot to do this afternoon. Uh, but um, with that, Mr. President, again, I, I do think we are looking at a potentially long day tomorrow. Uh, so with that, I would move that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Mitchell moves that the Senate do now adjourn. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Senate stands adjourned until 1 p.m. tomorrow.